um, has run into a little bit of a delay, but we're going to get started anyways. And um, so at, at this point in time, I'm going to uh, appoint Michael Barber as the hearing officer, and uh, Michael will run the uh, hearing from here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> So, uh, good morning. As the chair said, my name is Michael Barber. I've been appointed um, as a hearing officer for today's hearing. Um, the purpose of this hearing is to take evidence and argument on um, the 2020 Vermont Health Connect rate filing submitted by UBT Health Plan Inc. The docket number in this case is GMCB 005 19RR. Green Mountain Care Board has jurisdiction over this matter pursuant to Title 18 of the Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 9375 B6, as well as Title 8, Section 4062A. Uh, representing the carrier, MBT, are uh, Gary Carnegie and Ryan Long of the law firm Colonel Piper, Eggleston, and Kramer, PC. Representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate are Jay Engoff, Kylie Piper, and Eric Schulteis. I also want to recognize the board's associate general counsel, Amber and Averjali, who will be leading the examination of the board's actuaries, Lewis and Ellis. Um, we are recording today's proceedings. We have a court reporter here as well. We will transcribe the proceedings, and we will provide the parties with the transcripts as soon as we receive them. Um, I think I recognize most of the faces in the audience, but if we have members of the public here today, welcome. Uh, we, will, we will be taking public comment at the close of the proceedings today. There is a sign-up sheet, or there should be a sign-up sheet outside the room if you'd like to take advantage of that opportunity. However, uh, I can't say when we will get to the public comment portion of the meeting, and if you don't want to sit through several hours of testimony from actuaries to make a comment, we are having a meeting tomorrow from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Montpelier City Hall, and that meeting will be dedicated exclusively to hearing from the public. Uh, additionally, you can always submit written comments to the board via its website or by regular mail, and finally, you can call our offices to make a comment if you'd like. We will be accepting public comments through <coughs> July 25th. Um, before we begin, I want to remind the parties that um, and the board that some of the materials the MVP has submitted in this filing are confidential and you should exercise caution in discussing uh, anything that has been marked confidential in these binders um, because they can't be discussed in a, in a public setting. At this point, I think I'd like to swear in the witnesses. Um, so absent any rebuttal witnesses, we expect to hear from Matt Lombardo, Mike Fisher, Jacqueline Lee, and Jesse Lucier, who I don't see in the audience. So if, uh, if I called your name, if you could please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Now that we've sworn in the witnesses, uh, we have a binder of exhibits that the parties have stipulated to. Uh, I understand the binder contains 12 MVP exhibits, which are marked 1 through 12, and 16 exhibits from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, which are marked 13 through 28. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, Mr. Engoff, am I correct that the parties have stipulated to the admissibility of those documents? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, then at this point, I'm going to admit those documents into evidence. Does either party have anything we need to discuss before we get to opening statements? Mr. Hang on. No, sir. So you want to read it loud? Thank you very much. As you've already indicated, my name is Gary Carnegie and I represent MVP again this year of this 220 rate filing. I have with me my associate Ryan Long and as you've already indicated, Matt Lombard is here, who is the senior uh, leader of actual services from MVP and we're here again today as well. 
MVP's original maintenance rate filing saw an increase of 9.4% based on a multitude of issues. The evidence will show that l &E is recommended an increase to 2.5%, again based on a multitude of issues. The evidence will show that MVP agrees with all of l &E's recommendations. You will hear evidence also that based on recent hospital budget proposals, MVP is increasing its proposed rate to 11%. We do not yet know LNE's position uh, on the new hospital budget information, but we should hear more about that today. Consequently, the totality of evidence will show that all the expert actuaries in this case agree on virtually everything, agree on virtually all of MVP's proposed 11% increase. The HCA is not offering an expert actuary as it has in prior years, so no other expert actuaries will be testifying today in support of some substantially different, lower, or higher figure. As a matter of law, the decision by the board must be based on evidence, not on speculation of non-expert witnesses. The proposed premium should be found to be sufficient to pay for the services products covered. They should be actually really sound and statutorily adequate. It's important to recognize the interrelationship of all statutory criteria. Because of this interrelationship, although it is true that the board is not limited to actuarial considerations, in exercising its discretion, it should consider whether a change of rate based on a non-actuarial ground will run afoul of the actuarial data. Said another way, reduction should not ignore the math or ignore the actuarial evidence on what is needed for a statutorily adequate rate. A non-actuarial change in the rate still impacts the actuarial soundness of the rate fund. It's all interrelated. MVP recognizes the difficult choices the board has to make each year in balancing, in balancing statutory criteria. We respectfully submit that in considering other statutory criteria, such as affordability, in exercising its discretion, the board should consider the rate within what is actually sound and reasonable and statutorily adequate. The board should endeavor to avoid an unintended consequence of a rate decision that is not actuarially sound or reasonable. Actuaries are very zen-like in calculating rate increases. Let me give you an analogy. If you walk on most any trail in Vermont, you're going to come upon at some point a stack of odd stones that are stacked by somebody, and somehow they're balanced. The rocks are stacked on top of each other to find just the right balance to stand and not fall over. Each stone is like a statutory criteria, and the evidence will show that MVP and your actuaries at LD have found just the right balance to meet all the statutory criteria. You might be able to make a small adjustment to the amount to take a stone near the top and still maintain the balance. But if you pull a large stone from the middle of that pile, they all come tumbling down. The rates would no longer be adequate. So in considering the evidence, the board needs to keep an eye on all the interrelated statutory factors on the stack of statutory stones to maintain the balance. Daniel, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, it's no secret to the board that Vermont is unique in several ways. One of the ways it's unique is in the standard and the process that we go through in this proceeding. In all other states, there is no big hearing process like this. There are some states where there's prior approval where the company has to file its rates with the, with the insurance department, and those rates can't take effect unless the insurance department approves them. But there is no hearing process like this. So this is the most expansive hearing process in the country. Vermont is also unique, and this is even more important, in the standard that you all must use to determine whether or not a rate should be approved. In other states, the standard is 
is the rate excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? That's the sole standard. And that's what actuaries determine. You have a much tougher job than any regulator in any other state because you not only have to determine whether or not the rate is excessive or inadequate or unfairly discriminatory, which is what the actuary's expertise is confined to, but also you've got to determine whether the rate is affordable, whether it promotes quality, care, quality of care. Those are things that the actuary, no actuary, whether it's the MVP actuary or l &E or anyone else, those are things that are just not within an actuary's competence. In addition, although we use the term actuarial science, what actuaries do is not a science. The one thing you know about whatever the actuary's projection of the rate increase should be is that it's almost certain to be wrong. There's a big range within which people can disagree as to whether or not a rate increase is likely to be excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. Uh, MVP, sorry, l &E, to its credit, uh, notes that there are many different methodologies that can be used. And they pick one, MVP picks, picks one. MVP also, and MVP to its credit, acknowledges that in the past, last year, for example, the assumptions, some of the assumptions they made and some of the assumptions l &E made were wrong. So, all of this is, no, is certainly not a reason to, uh, to not have this hearing. What the, what the actuaries have to say is important. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So, Mr. Carney, call your first witness. Can you call Matt Lombardo, please? Exhibits one through eight. You'll see exhibit one is the original rate filing, correct? Correct. And then exhibit two is the amended rate filing, correct? And then after that, through eight are a series of responses by MVP to uh, questions uh, from the Mount Care Board, correct? Correct. And then exhibit nine, that's LNE's July 16th actuarial opinion, correct? Correct. And then Exhibit 10 is DFR's solvency analysis letter, correct? Correct. 
Exhibit 11 is an MVP's filing on July 11th of a non-standard goal design, correct? Correct. And then finally, Exhibit 12 is your CV, correct? Correct. And the balance of the exhibits are HCA exhibits, correct? Yes, correct. And you've reviewed all these exhibits and adopt them as your uh, testimony, with the exception, obviously, of the DFR exhibit and the LNE exhibit, correct? Correct. But you reviewed those two exhibits and are familiar with them, correct? Correct. And then next, Matt, I just ask you just to open up the first exhibit to any page and look on the bottom right-hand corner, and you'll see a darker number. You see that? Yes. So these are the page numbers that we put on all the exhibits. And I'd ask you as we talk, I'll refer to those pages, if you could do the same as well. Okay? Okay. All right, so let's start with an explanation at a high level of the rate increases. Uh, Matt, if you would go to exhibit two, please. Page 15. Okay, Matt. And you see under, there's three words, field name, requested change, and prior value. Do you see that? Yes. So would you tell the board what, oh, I'm sorry, and then go down to the bottom of the exhibit by the number 15, and do you see that date over to the left? Yes. What's that date? May 23rd, 2019. Okay, so this is the amended filing by uh, MVP on that date, correct? Correct. Okay, so going back up to where I was referencing, can you tell the board what the original filing rate increase request was and how it's changed in reference to those numbers, please? Yes, when we initially submitted rates on May 10th, we proposed an average rate increase of 9.38%. Upon review of an interrogatory from l &E, we identified the discrepancy that we use the proposed hospital budgets for 2019 rather than the approved hospital budgets. And we made that change uh, on May 23rd. The result was a decrease in the overall proposed rate increase at 8.45%. Thank you. Would you go to uh, Exhibit 9, please? Exhibit 9. This is the l and &E, uh, report dated July the 16th, correct? Correct. This is their amended report, correct? Correct. Okay. And would you go, please, to page 15 of that exhibit? Page 15. Okay. And do uh, you see that there's seven bullets on that page below recommendations? Yes. And these show some decreases and some decreases to the rate as proposed by Helene, correct? That's correct. And would you read the last sentence, please, on the page? After the modifications, the anticipated overall rate increase will increase from 9.4% to approximately 10.5%. And do you agree with that increase after re reviewing LNE's report? Based on the seven bullets, yes, I agree with that. And uh, Matt, as I understand it, uh, MVP received some additional hospital budget proposals on July the 16th, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, did MVP uh, make any adjustments to the proposed rate above this 10.5% as a result of that hospital budget proposal information? Although we didn't submit an amendment, an amendment, we did run through the calculations on our own. And when we updated our trend assumptions to reflect the proposed hospital budgets that were released on July 16th, the 10.5% increase changed to 11.0%. So, so the, the rate increase that MVP is proposing as you sit here today is 11%. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you know uh, what Elney's position is on moving from their 10.5 to the 11? I do not. We'll go through this in greater detail in the hospital budgets. Uh, I'd like to go back to Exhibit 2, please, which is the amended rate filing. And just walk through it on a few issues. Would you please go to page 15? Okay. That's the page we were at before. And you see where there's 
uh, references to maximum percent change and minimum percent change. You see that? Yes. Would you please ex explain the change of those numbers from what we originally filed to the amended file? Yeah, the original range was 5% to 23.7%. Uh, the requested change column represents 4.1% to 22.6% for an average of 8.5%. I will caveat that since um, we submitted the amended filing, DFR has come back and asked us to amend a plan design. That was the plan design that was receiving the 22.6% increase. <coughs> so that figure is actually going to go down to max to something about, you know, in the ballpark of 10% less than that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. And if you would go just down below there, there's a couple of, uh, I guess it's columns. Uh, but you see where it says product, product name, and so on, and then it says number of covered lives. You see that? Yes. And there's two references to number of covered lives, one above and one below. You yes. See that? Can you explain those, please? The Vermont Health Connect market is a merged market of individual policyholders and small group policyholders. In the individual market, MVP has 14,491 members or people covered. Um, in the small group market, 16,396 members. Thank you. Matt, would you please go to page 22 of Exhibit 2? Okay. Is this the actuarial memorandum that explains the rate final? Yes. And Matt, if you would please uh, go to the fourth paragraph under market slash benefits. Let me know when you're there. Okay, I'm there. And it, the first sentence says, all essential health benefits are covered. Do you see that? Yes. Can you explain that? One of the um, aspects of the Affordable Care Act was to ensure that adequate services were being rendered or covered under insurance policies that were ACA compliant. Uh, that list of benefits is called the essential health benefits. The federal government sets the floor for the minimum that can be covered, and then every state has the ability to actually define what the essential health benefits are. So all the benefit plans included in this filing are ACA compliant and uh, cover all the essential health benefits in the state of Vermont. Thank you. And Matt, in the next paragraph, it starts with the non-standard plans. You see that paragraph? Yes. Can you explain non how non-standard plans deal with this EHB? Yeah, uh, non-standard plans also have to cover EHBs. Um, so there's two, I'll go back. There's two types of plans being offered, standard plans and non-standard plans. Standard plans provide consumers with an apples apples shopping experience between uh, carriers. And then non-standard plans cover, um, give, the, give the carriers the ability to offer something a little different. Maybe it's different cost sharing elements like deductibles or co-pays, or you can offer additional benefits. In this case, MVP is offering a wellness benefit and our non-standard products that will cover up to $600 of reimbursement to, to policyholders that are that meet certain criteria. Thank you. And Matt, would you go to the last uh, paragraph on the page 22? And you'll see there's a reference to policyholders, subscribers, and members. Would you please describe to the board what the difference is between those three categories and the numbers that reference? Sure, I'll just read the sentence first. The book of business affected by this rate filing is 11,696 policyholders, 20,156 subscribers, 30,887 members based on February 2019 membership. So in the individual um, market, policyholder is the contract holder, which we'll talk about more in the subscriber number. Um, and then in the small group market, the employer is the policyholder. We offer single, fam single, double, parent-child, and family contracts. Um, in the case of a parent-child contract, for example, the adult holding the pop that holds contracts is considered the subscriber, and then the children plus the contract holder are all members. So members are people. Um, subscribers are generally the, the person that is the zero, zero subscriber member ID on the plan. Matt, would you go to page 23, please? 
And do you see in the second to last paragraph it makes reference to a CSR subsidy program? Yes. So that's something that you considered in this amended uh, filing, correct? Correct. Would you please uh, explain the CSR subsidy program? The CSR subsidy program was a feature of the ACA to help um, policyholders in the individual market that met certain income restrictions to help alleviate some of the pressure of cost sharing. So cost sharing being deductibles, co-insurance, or co-pays. Um, the federal government, plus there's an additional subsidy from the state of Vermont, um, were funding, it was funding the CSR program. The state of Vermont is still funding their portion of the CSR program, but the federal government stopped funding uh, the program in October of 2017, and it's still not funded today. Thank you. Matt, would you go to page 26? And you see in the second to last paragraph, there's a reference to the line 19 adjustment for association health plans. Can you see that? Yes. So association health plans, were considered in this rate filing, correct? Correct. Would you please go to Exhibit 6? Exhibit 6. Okay. This is a uh, response to an objection question by l &E. So it's a response by MVP to a question from l &E, correct? Correct. And if you reference number 2, you see where it makes reference to the AHP market? Yes. So would you please explain uh, what was happening with the associated health plans this year and how MVP addressed it? Beginning in 2019, associations could band together smaller, their, their smaller member groups and purchase non-Vermont Health Connect uh, policies. MVP did not offer any of those policies in 2019. And based on our analysis, we estimate that approximately um, 20% of the 4,869 members that left the exchange market to go to association health plans were from MVP. We analyzed the morbidity, um, the historical claim cost with uh, risk score adjustments for that for the population that left MVP versus who remained, and we found that, generally speaking, the, the, the population that left was much healthier. Now, since then, um, on June 13, 2019, DFR Bolton 205 um, declared that in 2020, association health plans will not be offered in Vermont. As a result, MVP is retracting the adjustment, um, which was on light item. I, I, I don't recall which line item, but we are retracting the adjustment, which was worth close to 1%. And that's reflected in the 11% uh, we're seeking today, correct? Correct. I know I'm having you shuffle back and forth, but would you mind going back to Exhibit 2, please, page 31. such as um, overhead, maintaining claims operating systems, uh, and so on and so forth, will be approximately $42 per member per month. And uh, you, you've reviewed l &E's filing, correct? Correct. And uh, did l and &E find the administrative expense load uh, in this 42 p.m. p.m. number reasonable and appropriate? Yes. We'll talk more about that later. Let's go to page 32, please. You see at the top it says contribution to reserves risk charge. Yes. What is MVP proposing for a CTR this year? 1.5%. Okay. 
And what did the MVP propose last year? 2%. And what did the board approve last year? 1.5%. And just above that, do you see there's a reference to bad debt expense? Yes. So last year, board member Yusufer asked you about bad debt expense, so I thought we could touch on that briefly now. What is it? What is bad debt expense? Bad debt is the risk of a policyholder not paying premium. Um, the way that we develop a rate is that we start with claims and then project them forward to arrive at our claim projection for the projection year of 2020 in this case. There are instances where policyholders aren't actually paying premium and we are still covering claims for a time period even though we haven't collected premium for them. So in our rate development, there's no contemplation of a policyholder not paying premium and this adjustment, which is based on historical averages, it, it, it accounts for the fact that we are paying claims, yet we're not collecting premium for everyone. And when you say this adjustment, is that the 0.4%? Correct. And that's uh, based at least in part on uh, prior years, is that right, historical data? Yes. Why is the bad debt number? Why is that a separate line in the rate map, separate from CTR? Um, it's, it's a separate charge. It's separate and distinct from contributions to reserves or any other portion of the rate buildup. So CTR is based on monies for claims and the other things you identify, and this is based, to, based on, uh, the bad debt expense is based on people not paying their premium. Is that right? That's right. Having those items separate, is that actuarially sound? Yes. Matt, would you turn it, please, to Exhibit 11? Okay. This is a July 11th, 2019 uh, letter from MVP, correct? That's correct. And you signed it, correct? Yes. And there's a reference in the second paragraph to goal two non-standard plan. Do you see that? Yes. So would you please explain what the purpose of this uh, filing is? After our submission, um, DFR, upon, upon review of a modification to the non-standard goal two plan, found that it was out of compliance with the uh, CMS's regulation of uniform modification of coverage. As a result, we are going back and modifying our plan design to be much more similar to the plan that is being offered in 2019. The changes that we were offering were to try to remove the deductible um, from the plan. We have an $850 deductible in place today. MVP's proposed plan design was to uh, offer a zero deductible plan. Uh, because the change was so large, it fell outside the range of uniform modification of coverage which um, is resulting in us having to refile this plan design. And Matt, this is something that was required by DFR, correct? That's correct. And would you please read the first sentence of the last paragraph? The first document confirms that the updated plan design fits within the gold medal level and satisfies federal AV requirements. You agree with that? You vote that, right? Yes. And then, Let's go down to the uh, second to last sentence that starts consistent with. Would you please read that sentence? Consistent with the calculation performed by l and &E in the actual memorandum dated July 9th, 2019, the impact of this plan design change on the contract weighted rate increase is a decrease of approximately 0.2%. Okay, so the goal two non-standard plan modification to design resulted in an overall rate decrease of 0.2%, is that correct? On the overall contract weighted rate increase, yes. The actual plan change, goal two non-standard is much larger. And would you read that last sentence please on that issue? The goal two non-standard rate increase for 2020 is now proposed to be 10.4%, reduced from the 22.6% increase in the amended filing. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to pivot to l &E recommendations this year. Would you go to Exhibit 9, page 15, please?
Okay? And we looked at this briefly earlier. You see there's seven bullets regarding recommendations. You see those? Yes. I want to go through each one, but uh, overall, does MVP agree with LE's recommendations? Yes. So let's start with the first one. Cost trend from 2018 to 2020. Do you see that? Yes. What is a cost trend? Cost trend is just general inflation. So if a service costs $100 in 2018, and we anticipate the cost to be $110 in 2020, then that represents a 10% trend over both years. And there's a reference to the uh, hospital budgets in that area, correct? Correct. So are hospital costs part of the cost trend? Yes. And uh, I believe you testified to this earlier, but MVP, its original filing, used uh, original rate filing rather than approved hospital budgets. Is that right? Yes. And so this first bullet, what does it result in terms of change? It's a reduction of 0.9%. It's the same 0.9% that we discussed, the impact of the proposed filing to the amended filing. So we agree with this recommendation, correct? Yes, correct. Let's go to the second bullet, please. Cost trend from 2019 to 2020. Do you see that? Yes. Would you read the first sentence, please? If updated information regarding unit cost trends are known at the time of the board order, L&E recommends updating the assumed unit cost trends in the 2020 premium rate calculations. And do you agree with that recommendation? Yes. And are there challenges in considering unit cost trend related to hospital budgets here in Vermont? The timeline, um, the timeline of the hospital budget approval isn't aligned with when rates are proposed or decisions are rendered. So we submitted our initial rate filing on May 10th. Um, we did not receive the final proposed hospital budgets until July 16th. A rate decision will be rendered sometime in early to mid-August, and we don't anticipate to receive approved hospital budgets until sometime after that. So that's a challenge? Yes. And uh, in April or thereabouts this year, uh, the board made some rate changes for several hospital facilities, is that right? That's correct. There were uh, adjustments made from the approved hospital budgets uh, for two hospitals after the initial decision rendered in the fall. So uh, that was not contemplated at the time of the hospital budget approval issue, correct? Correct. And that all that poses a second challenge, correct? Correct. And then third, are there facilities that are not under the Greenmount Care Board's <coughs> jurisdiction? Yes, uh, MVPs, Benefits and products offered in this filing cover a nationwide network uh, of providers and facilities and, and pharmacies. Um, so MVP contracts directly with most facilities in upstate New York and providers. We also contract with Dartmouth-Hitchcock in New Hampshire. And after that, we rely on a national carrier um, to use their network so that if a Vermonter is vacationing in Arizona or California, um, and they need medical care, they can access a provider or facility with, uh, it, as an in-network provider with no additional cost sharing above and beyond what's in their benefits if they saw a provider right up the street. Thank you, Matt. Would you please go in that exhibit, go to page five, please? Page five. You see that there's a bullet on the bottom. Do you see that? Yes. Would you read that, please? <coughs> Approximately 40% of medical services are provided by hospitals not subject to the Green Mountain Care Board hospital budgeting, budgeting process. Now, uh, originally, in Eleni's first uh, uh, filing, did they have a different percentage there? Yes. And what was that percentage? I believe it was 55%. Um, so they uh, they clarified that uh, error, correct, with this filing on um, 
July 16th, correct? Yes, correct. And by making that change, does that change your agreement with l &E on their ultimate uh, conclusions? It does not impact the proposed rate change. And then in that, there's a little blue box uh, next to the bullet. See where it says GMC the hospital budget review? Yes. And there's a number two there. Would you read that, please? A trend of 5.5% for other medical facilities and providers that are not subject to the hospital budget review. And does this uh, figure change based on Eleni making the one change to 40 to 55%? It does not. Now, you, you referenced earlier on uh, hospital budget proposals on that came in, I think the last one came in on Tuesday, July the 16th, correct? Correct. And that's similar to last year, it kind of came in just prior to the hearing? Yes. And uh, what uh, what did you indicate MVP is doing based on, based on that data? We updated our trends to reflect what's in the proposed hospital budgets, and it's having an overall impact on the proposed increase of an additional increase of 0.5% to go to 11% in total. Now, coincidentally, what did MVP do last year to adjust based on the hospital budget proposals? Yeah, coincidentally, it was the same figure of 0.5%. And you recall what l &E did last year? l &E, um, reviewed historical differences between what was ultimately approved and what was proposed. And their overall recommendation was to look at the historical averages. And it was something greater than zero, but less than 0.5%. So our, our opinion is that we should be working with the information that's known at this time, which is why we're building in the proposed hospital budgets for this year. And uh, last year, where did l &E land in terms of what the percentage should be in their view? Uh, if I recall, it was 0.2%. And as you sit here today, uh, not knowing exactly what l is gonna do with this hospital budget issue, uh, <coughs> But as far as you know, that, that's the only potential dispute we have with l &E this year? Yes. Um, there, there is risk in making that adjustment because historical, historical adjustments may not be consistent with what happens for this year's uh, hospital budgets. Last year, as, as we mentioned earlier, we did experience an increase um, this, this spring, which wasn't contemplated in the initially approved hospital budgets. So there is some risk in following historical averages. With that said, um, we are again building in 0.5%, which is our, the data that's known at the time as of right now. Thank you. Matt, would you go back to the summary page, page 15, please? Okay. The third bullet references medical utilization trend. Do you see that? Yes. What is medical utilization trend? Medical utilization trend is just the change in the number of services being rendered. So there's two components to get to a total dollar trend. One is on inflation, which we discussed earlier, and the other one is on frequency, which is <coughs> utilization. l and &E is recommending that the medical utilization trend be increased from MVP's proposal of 0.0% to 1.0% per year, which will increase rates by approximately 1.5%. Do you agree with that recommendation? Yes, l and &E, um, MVP has experienced a lot of growth in this market in the last few years. l and &E has the ability to analyze data from both sets of carriers, so they have uh, a full snapshot of the QHP market. So their data and their analysis is more robust and more comprehensive than what MVP has at its fingertips for utilization for trend purposes. Great, so let's go to page six of the exhibit, please, on that point. At the very bottom of that page, there's a sentence that starts because. Do you see that? Yes. Would you read that sentence, please? Because of the atypical results produced by MVP's analysis using their own data, l and &E analyzed utilization trends by using market-wide utilization data, i.e. a combination of utilization data from both QHP carriers. <clears throat> 
And that's what you were talking about a moment ago, correct? Yes, correct. And if you go to page seven at the bottom, you'll see a bullet, and then you'll see two bullets that go into page eight. Can you see those? Yes. Please read those. First bullet. LNE notes MVP's utilization trend has oscillated in recent years and has increased in 2018. Next bullet. The increased assumption is more reflective of market-wide data, which is less impacted by significant shifts in membership between carriers. <coughs> bullet. LNE believes this assumption is based on more credible data than MVP's closed cohort analysis. And the last sentence makes reference to the rate increase of approximately 1.5%, doesn't it? Yes. And you agree with that, correct? Yes. Great. Let's go back to page 15 and go to the next one, please. The next one on page 15, the next bullet, is AHP morbidity impact. Can you see that? Yes. What does LNE recommend there? Now he is recommending we remove the HP morbidity load on claims, which we discussed earlier, which would reduce the projected premiums by approximately 0.8%. And we discussed that earlier, and MVP agrees with that, correct? Correct. Okay, you see the next bullet, high cost member program, you see that? Yes. What is the program, please? There's a national high cost reinsurance pool that exists because at a certain level, risk adjustment, risk adjustment is used to normalize morbidity of populations, but at a certain claim level, um, risk adjustment just doesn't work on the outlier claims. So CMS identified this as an issue. If a, if a carrier has a disproportionate share of high cost claims in excess of a million dollars, they will receive 60% of those dollars back uh, through this national reinsurance program. Carriers are assessed a fee based on their percentage of total nationwide premium. So in this case, um, MVP didn't have any members that were eligible for a recovery over a million dollars in the Vermont exchange market, but we are paying into the program because we have to pay our share of the nationwide premium. Okay, and if you go back to the bullet for high cost member program, what does the last clause say? LNE recommends that the assumption for the Federal high cost member program be moved in the URT from risk adjustment to net reinsurance, which has no impact on the rates. So the last clause, they say no impact on rates. Do you agree with that? Yes. The next bullet is changes to risk adjustment. Do you see that? Yes. And what does LNE say there, please? LNE is recommending that. Um, change to our risk adjustment from what was initially proposed in our rates to our final results with an adjustment for 2020 risk adjustment coefficients is an increase of approximately 1.5%. Thank you. Would you please go to page 11, please? Okay. And you see at the bottom there's a number of paragraph 10 which references change to risk adjustment. Do you see that? Yes. This explains the rationale that uh, LNE used, correct? Correct. Okay. So the second sentence uh, describes uh, the data that MVP had at the time of the file, correct? Would you correct. Read, would you read that sentence, please? Yep. The most recent data available at submission was the interim report published by CMS in late March and the confirmation of the number of months each carrier had submitted for the interim report. So late March data, right? That's correct. Okay. And then if you turn to page 12. Okay. That first paragraph at the top, what did LNE first do? LNE requested that both carriers provide um, final CMS risk adjustment data in the form of the rate E file, risk adjustment transfer elements extract. They, ca they, took, they gathered MVP's data, plus Blue Cross's data, and computed what risk transfer payments and receipts would be for the 2018 plan year. So the, they used more data from both carriers, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the second paragraph, what happened on June 28th? CMS released the final 
risk transfer results for the 2018 plan year, which is the same set of data that we're using to set our premium rates for 2020. And uh, did that data, does that any indicate that that data confirmed their prior calculus we just talked about in the first paragraph? Yes, the calculation change was immaterial. And then there's a paragraph after that says additionally. Do you see that paragraph? Yes. So what else did l &E do after receiving the CMS information? In addition to the CMS information, the final results, CMS cha is changing the coefficients or the weights for certain um, disease states or age gender factors in 2020. So for example, um, a, a 40 year old single male on a platinum plan in 2018 may have had a risk score of an X. In 2020, that may be 0.9 of an X. Um, when you take both sets of data from the carriers and simulate it using the 2020 coefficients instead of using the 2018 coefficients, the risk transfer results change and the adjustment of which is worth approximately, uh, it's going from MVP paying 55.61 per member per month into risk adjustment to 64.15 per member per month. The 64.15 PMPM is more representative of what we would anticipate to happen in 2020 because of the updated coefficients. And Matt, the reference to, uh, read the clause, it says, because MVP has a disproportionate <coughs> share of lower risk and lower benefit uh, members. Why is that significant in the study they did on diagnosis and enrollment? Because the shift in the 2018 to the 2020 coefficients, the result, so in risk adjustment, healthier policyholders are paying into the program while higher risk policyholders are receiving money to end up at zero sum game. The changes between 2018 and 2020 is going to result in the lower morbidity population paying more into risk adjustment, which is why MVP is seeing a big increase um, due to the fact that we do enroll more uh, low risk and low benefit members. And that, that portion of this analysis reflected an increased rate of 1.8%, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And then read the last sentence, please. Combined with the first recommendation, the overall recommended change to the risk adjustment transfer projection results in a 1.5% increase to the 2020 premium rates. And you agree with that 1.5% increase? Yes. And simply put, did l &E have significantly more data to come up with that increase? That's, that's correct. Matt, let's go back to page 15. We're making progress. Changes to actuarial value. Do you see that last bullet? Are we in exhibit 15? No, I, page, page 15. Okay. Exhibit 9. Okay. Sorry if I missed Let me go back. You see the last bullet? Changes to actuarial value? Yes. Okay. So, uh, would you just identify what that changes, the amount, and what it is? The, the changes to actuarial value will reflect a 0.2% decrease from to the overall book of business proposed rate increase. This is the non-standard goal to benefit design change that we had discussed earlier. Um, MVP initially proposed a benefit design that would have no deductible in 2020. The current plan design for that plan is an $850 deductible. The results, uh, DFR, after DFR reviewed, they said that that was too large of a change to make, and we have to offer a benefit design that's closer to the 2019 plan offering, which is going to be a reduction in benefits, and therefore a corresponding reduction in premium rate. And all of that is reflected in that Exhibit 11 we looked at a moment ago, correct? Yes, that's correct. Was MVP, con the products department in MVP, contacted by DFR on Friday, after this last week? My understanding is that they were. And what did uh, DFR call about? After the initial um, notification from DFR to MVP, MVP modified the plan design to be close to the 2019 plan design, 
but still a, a slight reduction in deductible and a couple other different changes of benefit. DFR contacted MVP on Friday and let us know that they would like us to offer a benefit design that's even closer to the 2019 benefit design. Um, so we're still evaluating the impact of those changes and what that exact plan design is going to be. But as you sit here today, do you believe that change that they requested on Friday will impact this 0.2 reduction? I do not. I, I do expect it to impact the gold non-standard 2 premium rate, but I don't expect it to impact the overall book of business average rate increase because there is not significant amount of enrollment in that plan design. And we expect to file something later today on that. That's my understanding, correct. So uh, at the bottom of page 15, thank you for going through all those with me. At the bottom of page 15, that summary sentence indicates 9.4 to 10.5 pursuant to LE's opinions, correct? That's correct. In your opinion, are all of these seven recommendations? and the overall increase from 9.4 to 10.5, adding the 0.5 for the recent possible budget proposals to 11%, is all that actuarially sound and reasonable? Yes, that is all actuarially sound and reasonable. And in, in your opinion, is 11% the best number? Yes. Thank you. Matt, I wonder if you could tell the board a little about MVP's uh, market share and competitive posture. Over the last few years, MVP has been able to improve our competitive premium position. And as a result, we've grown from somewhere around 10% of the market a few years ago to approximately 40% of the market as of today. And we've achieved that, again, through trying to manage costs down and offering a more affordable premium rate in the, in the QHP market. Thank you. Next, Matt, I want to ask you about reserves and solvents. Um, do you you, in your opinion, contributions to reserves in isolation for just one year as it relates to solvency? We generally view solvency over the long haul. It, it, it's a little bit bold. So we want every filing to be self-supporting and be able to um, ensure that we're not running at an operating loss, which is going to take down our reserve level. But over the long, we also view it as if there's one year fluctuation, um, as long as it's not too significant, we can manage within that. We generally don't want to shock the market just to achieve some target reserve level. We generally would rather step into it over, uh, over a few years. Thank you. Matt, would you go back to exhibit two, page 32? top of the page, we touched on this earlier, I want to talk in more detail. You see the reference to contribution to reserves at 1.5%? Yes. And you testified that last year MVP sought 2%. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to Exhibit 10, DFR Solvency Analysis. Please. Exhibit 10. Familiar with this letter dated July 10, 2019? Yes. And would you please read the sentence under summary of opinion? The proposed rate filed by MVP HP would not negatively impact its solvency when the company otherwise meets Vermont's financial licensing requirements for an insurer. I'm sorry, requirements I didn't hear. For a foreign insurer. Thank you. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. And would you go to the second page, please, and read the third bullet on the second page? Finally, in 2018, all of MVP holding companies' operations in Vermont accounted for approximately 4.8% of its total premiums written. DFR has determined that MVP HP's Vermont operations pose little risk to its solvency. Nonetheless, Adequacy of rates and contribution to surplus are necessary for all health insurers to maintain strength of capital that keeps pace with claims trends. And do you agree with those statements next to bullet three? Yes. Okay. 
And then read under the heading just below there, it says impact of the filing on solvency. Please read those uh, sentences. Based on the entity-wide assessment above and contingent upon GMCB actuary's finding that the proposed rate is not inadequate, DFR's opinion is that the proposed rate will not have a negative impact on MVPHP solvency. Do you agree with that? Yes. In your opinion, will the increase from our original filing of 9.4% to 11% adversely impact the solvency of MVP Healthcare Inc.? It will not. Although our proposed rate has changed, has our CTR remained the same at 1.5%? Yes. Please go to Exhibit 9, page 14. see a heading that says 15 changes in contribution to reserves? Yes. And this is l and uh, amended report, correct? Correct. Okay, so go to the second paragraph under that heading. Okay. And you'll see there's a reference to a reasonableness, reasonableness check. And there's a reference to 2019. You see that? Yes. And in the next paragraph, you see a reference to 2018? Yes. Would you tell me what this reasonableness check that uh, l &E talks about here, what that's about? l and &E accessed 1,600, approximately 1,600 uh, filings that were submitted in the last two years. And what they identified was that MVP's proposed CTR of 1.5% is approximately the 20th percentile, meaning out of the 1,600 filings uh, that l &E reviewed, 80% of the filings had a CTR included that was greater than 1.5%. Okay. And then the fourth paragraph under 15 starts based on l and &E's evaluation. You see that paragraph? Yes. Would you please read those two sentences? Based on l &E's evaluation of MVP CTR compared to the assumed CTR levels underlying every QHP filing submitted 2018 and 2019, l &E believes that MVP's proposed CTR is reasonable in light of its underlying risks. l and &E believes that this allows the company to offset potential adverse events with appropriate consideration given to maintaining the CTR at an adequate long-term level. So uh, I, I know you haven't seen, well, let me ask you, have you seen the underlying data of their reasonableness checks for those two years? I have not. But based on this summary, uh, do you agree with the two sentences you just read in uh, paragraph four under heading 15? Yes. Okay, and if you go down to the sixth paragraph, just above the number 16, Okay. Would you read the first sentence in that paragraph, please? l and &E believes the CTR assumption is reasonable and does not recommend any changes to the CTR. In addition to l and &E's review, l and &E recommends that any solvency analysis performed by the Department of Financial Regulation be considered. And you agree with both of those statements? Yes. And then in the fifth paragraph just above, Paragraph you just read, there's a reference to bad debt. Do you see that? Yes. Now, we talked about that before, right? You explained bad debt? Yes. There's a reference here to the 0.4%. What is l &E saying about 0.4%? l and &E reviewed MVP's historical bad debt percentages. And over the last three years, the average amount was 0.4%, which is the amount that we're building into our proposed premium rate for 2020. So Matt, I want to pivot now and talk a little bit about lowering costs, promoting quality, care and access and affordability. Um, staying with Exhibit 9, can you please go to page 13? Okay. And you'll see uh, paragraph number 13 on that page called Changes in Administrative Costs. Do you see that? Yes. And there's two paragraphs. Can you read the last sentence in the last paragraph, please? 
In light of the steps taken by MVP to reduce administrative costs over the recent years, the assumed administrative 2020 costs are reasonable and appropriate. And do you agree with the commentary in uh, the two paragraphs under 13? Yes. So let's go to the first paragraph. Okay. Read, read the last two sentences, please. The overall rate impact is a decrease of 1% because the premium is also increasing from the 2019 exchange filing, the administrative expenses as a percentage of premium are decreasing. So what that means is that even though the PMPM is increasing, it's increasing at a slower rate than the proposed rate increase, which is having a dampening effect on the overall rate impact. In the second uh, paragraph in this section, Melanie talks a bit about the Waka members in New York and their relationship with the Waka members in Vermont, correct? Correct. Can you explain that to the board and how that impacts on these percentages and uh, increases and decreases? Yes, yeah, so even though we have experienced a lot of growth in Vermont, that's been more than offset by contraction in our membership in our New York business. Um, and we have fixed costs that are spread across both states. The example I generally go to is a claims operating system. We have one claims operating system that is physically housed in New York, but it's used by members regardless of which state it's in. So the cost of maintaining that claims operating system and any kind of um, administrative expenses associated with it or employees it has to be spread across MVP's entire membership base. And because the overall membership base has decreased by about 5% over the last two years, that is increasing the overall per member per month levels. Okay. And so Eleni talks about that a bit in the second pair, correct? That's correct. So given all of that, did Eleni find uh, our changes related to administrative costs uh, reasonable and appropriate? Yes. Matt, first I'm going to start with a general question for you. As and will MVP take steps to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish that its rates proposed are affordable to Vermonters? Yes. Would you please go to exhibit five? Another MVP response uh, to, in this case, non-actuarial provocateurs, correct? That's correct. That's what it says at the beginning of Exhibit 5, Head, correct? Correct. Would you go to page 2, please? Okay. And let me read the question on page 2. Please describe the evidence you intend to rely on to establish rates proposed and filing are affordable to Vermonters. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And then if you start on page two, you see there's a number of paragraphs that start at number one, right? Yes. And they go to 44 items on page six? Yes. Okay, so I want to go through these and explain to the board how uh, this all relates to the question of steps MVP has taken to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish the rates both affordable to Vermont. Okay? Uh, I, I don't think we have time to go through them in order, one through 44, but let's identify three categories I want to talk about. All right? Now let's start first with uh, managing care and medication, second with managing administrative costs and contracts, and then third we're going to talk about managing the plan and membership. Okay. So let's start with the first one, and you're free to reference some of these numbered paragraphs as you talk and I'll help you through them. So starting with managing care and medication, let's first talk about primary care, please. Again, keeping in mind those statutory issues that I described for you, you can talk to the board about primary care. 
The MVP is a strong believer that primary care should be centered to a patient's um, medical experience. Um, having a regular contact, having regular contact with your PCP, not only does it help establish a relationship where there can be efficiencies created because they know your medical history, but they will also be able to delegate or uh, refer care in the most efficient way possible. So if you have a if, if you have a solid relationship with your PCP, um, there are downstream effects that can help avoid future higher costs because they'll be able to know your history and will be able to direct you appropriately. We also have a quality program in place for PCP, so if they meet certain quality criteria, there's financial incentives attached. So we also, in addition to trying to um, reduce costs down the road, it's important to us that not only is it an, an affordable product, but it's also a high quality product. So certain metrics such as you know, well screenings and uh, procedures within your well screening visit are followed. Thank you. And looking at item three, part of which is redacted, uh, just at a high level, there's a reference to a marketplace primary care improvement program. What's that? If that? That's the program I was referencing where PCTs um, meets certain quality metrics, there's a financial incentive attached for them. Okay. And item six references aligning fees to increase access. Can you describe that, please? Yeah, so we've taken steps in recent years to ensure um, that there isn't as large of a spread between hospital and physician reimbursement versus community physician reimbursement. Um, it's important that the physician that's down the road in Montpelier is compensated comparably to the physicians that are employed by hospitals. And what that, can, what that does is there isn't a strong incentive for physicians to only be employed by larger hospitals and it'll provide hopefully higher care in the community-based physician offices. Thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, MVPs hiring and using uh, clinician staff. Could you explain that? Yeah, MVP employs a comprehensive staff of clinicians ranging from respiratory therapists and registered nurse all the way through MDs. And we have a number of programs in place to help members when they have a critical point um, in their life where they need to use medical care. So we, we have um, a transplant network in place where you have one-on-one -on -one contact with an MVP clinician to help direct you to the appropriate facility. And we only use um, the highest quality transplant networks because these are really high cost, complex, um, complex procedures that are performed. And what we want to ensure is that there aren't downstream impacts. If you, um, if you go to a lower quality transplant, out, transplant facility, you may not have the same outcomes. We also have a critical program where, critical program in place, where if a member unfortunately receives a, a negative or unfavorable diagnosis, such as um, intense cancer, then we have a program in place to help contact those members and help guide them through the process because we recognize that the healthcare system is complex and especially when you're dealing with one of these life events that can be life altering and we wanna to try to provide the most positive experience possible to our members. And, and on the front of trying to reduce costs, we also have a um, program in place where we analyze members that have been accessing the ER in a, in a non-traditional fashion. So members that may have three plus ER visits in 90 days, we reach out to them um, and try to provide some education materials to let them know that we have other programs in place or uh, such as our telemedicine benefit, which has been great in recent years. We've seen uptake and utilization, and that's a great program that we'll talk about. And additionally, where we can direct them to an urgent care facility, which is a lot lower cost, somewhere between you know 20% less uh, on average for the uh, telemedicine to somewhere between, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke on those percentages. It's around $45 for a, a telemedicine visit and can be upwards of $1,000 for an ER visit. So we're really trying to promote access and provide um, some cost relief. Mr. Hearing Officer, I don't want to interfere with their putting on their case, but in this case, Mr. Lombardo is not testifying as an actuary, right? He's testifying as a uh, 
as an executive with knowledge of the company's policies. Is it point of clarification or an objection? I'm sorry? Is that a point of clarification or an objection? Yeah, I, I just want to, yeah, I, I would just like to make it clear that it, it appears that Mr. Lombardo is not testifying in his capacity as an actuary. He is testifying as a corporate executive, which is certainly uh, uh, a reasonable thing for him to do. But this is not actuarial testimony. Taken. The only thing I would I would uh, say on that is, although Mr. Lombardo was wearing a suit, I don't know if you would take offense to be calling a corporate executive or not. He's a fact witness. He's wearing many hats here today. He's also an expert witness. So you can you can draw whatever, whatever conclusions you like about his testimony. Or he's been disclosed as such. So uh, Matt, let's let's go back. You referenced, by way of example, some. Uh, particular uh, care management programs, some specific ones, but there's a number of those that MVP administers. I'm looking at number 10. Yes. Yeah, so we also have care management programs in place uh, for members that are being uh, discharged from a, from a hospital, from an inpatient setting, trying to guide them through uh, helping them maintain their health after they leave the hospital, which will help reduce readmissions and therefore reduce costs down the road. And uh, Matt, you talked about a, a number of different types of clinicians on staff. Um, are there nurses available to take uh, calls 24-7? I'm looking at number eight. Yes, MVP has a 24-7 uh, nurse helpline available. So if something happens in the middle of the night or holiday where offices are closed, um, we can provide a member with somewhat of a triage uh, to direct them to the appropriate place or what they should actually do. And uh, does MVP also provide health care case managers to help folks when they're navigating all of this? Yeah, as I referenced earlier, we recognize that the healthcare system is complex and it may not be, how your claims are going to be paid may not be the first thing on your mind if you're facing a crisis. Um, so we have case managers to help intervene and educate and inform members and monitor whether or not um, members are following up with their physicians and adhering to their prescriptions. And looking at item 14, how is engagement in going with the monitors? So it's been successful. There's been 30% of Vermont members that we've, uh, that we've specifically contacted have accepted um, some form of care management, and we're proud of those statistics. Uh, it, it's to be able to achieve three out of 10 Vermont members to be willing to accept care management and help um, understand the healthcare system and as they're stepping through their, their policies and through their treatment, it's really great. Next, Matt, I'd like to, under, again, managing care medication, website online tools and telemedicine. Can you explain some of those efforts to Yeah, I, I do want to clarify item 22, um, where we quote that there was 2.1 million sessions in 2018. That figure is from after last year's rate hearing. So that's approximately six and a half months of data. We did go back and we analyzed August 1st, 2018 through the end of June of 2019, so 11 months. And there was overall about 3.5 million sessions. Because there is a lot of really helpful information on MVP's website. Um, whether or not it's how to go through, it, whether or not it's to identify where doctors are within your service area or wherever you're located. So the example I was providing earlier where if you're on vacation in Arizona or California, you can still go on MVP's website and, and find a doctor for any condition that's within a certain radius of the, of the city or zip code where you're located. Um, additionally, there's a lot of great information on the website about health and wellness. Um, and there's also information that leads you to telemedicine. So the telemedicine benefit, as I was mentioning, that provides you, if you have a, a cell signal, provides you with the ability to um, have 24 7 365 day a year urgent care or mental health visit with your with your doctor and 
I, I utilize that, um, that benefit, and I've had a really positive experience, and that's consistent with MVP's members, where the vast majority of them gave it a four or five star rating out of five stars. And Matt, would you expand a little bit, if you go to item 25, about the online tool to locate a care provider and explain that a little bit more as it relates to Vermont? So in addition to just identifying where uh, providers are, are located, there's also a cost estimate calculator that's provided. So you can see what the costs are. If, if you're in a product that's driven by a deductible and you know that you're going to pay out of pocket expense, um, the cost treatment calculator will estimate the cost of the procedure for various providers within your given uh, chosen radius where you're located. Additionally, there's also a pharmacy comparison tool. So you can see, again, if you're under a deductible or you have a co-insurance benefit, then it's helpful to understand um, what your out-of-pocket is expected to be. So you can use a similar tool for prescription drugs that will inform you what the, what the cost of a given drug is at various pharmacies within a given uh, area. Thank you. There's a, in 24, there's a reference to a welcome packet. So in contrast to the website, how about at the outset? Yeah, whenever, whenever someone enrolls with MVP, they receive um, a welcome packet that tries to provide a simple understanding of the benefits that they've that they've purchased, and also provides an understanding of some common terms that are that are used, like copay, deductible, coinsurance. There's been some studies that have been performed that uh, show that the average consumer doesn't even understand what those terminologies mean. I think we take it for granted sometimes because we talk this language all the time. And it's important that we can provide some sort of knowledge to our members um, before they start accessing care so they can have a reference point and understand exactly what they purchased from us. And referencing item 30, uh, is MVP providing anything for uh, folks who might enroll mid-year? Yes, we have um, you know, the website is designed to help someone that does not enroll during the open enrollment period, which ends on December 15th. You may have a life event, you may get married or have a child or change employer. And in that case, you need to enroll or you should enroll in your policy off cycle. And MVP provides um, tools available to members so they can understand those special enrollment periods. Thank you. And then, Matt, the last item under this category is item 44. Can you read that, please? MVP continues to negotiate with one care. And Matt, would you go to please exhibit 5A? This is a confidential exhibit, so I don't want you to say anything. Okay. And then you turn to page 8 of the exhibit. Okay. What I'd like you to do is read the questions. So read four and then pause. Read four A and pause. Read four B and pause. To allow the board time to read the responses on the one page. Okay. Number four. Please describe your plans for contracting with One Care Vermont in the 2020 plan year, if any. Four A. If you plan to contract with One Care in the 2020 plan year, do you expect to incorporate capitated payments? Four B. If you plan to contract with One Care in the 2020 plan year, do you expect this partnership to impact rates? If so, when? Thank you. So. Generally now, uh, what has MVP done in terms of uh, its team at the company dealing with value-based uh, risk sharing? MVP recognizes that the fee-for-service model has not worked. And um, in addition to one care in Vermont, New York State has rolled out a roadmap for our Medicaid population where you have to have certain uh, a certain number of contracts or percent of your overall dollars covered by Medicaid in some sort of risk share arrangement. So level one risk share arrangements are arrangements where only 
Um, the carrier is taking risk. Level two arrangements are where there's shared risk between the carrier and the provider group. And level three is a capitated, um, is a capitated thing, uh, arrangement where only the provider is taking risk. So MVP, again, we recognize that the fee-for-service model is, has not been working. So we are putting additional staff towards this focus to try to improve on the, the contracts that we're writing and understand what's driving costs. Um, as of right now, our experience in New York, as, as you know, um, we did not participate with One Care in 2019. Um, in New York, we've had some experience over a couple of years. The results of value-based contracting have been mixed. Uh, the one positive that I'd say is, well, not the one positive, but one of the big positives is that we're sharing information with the provider groups to help inform them so they have a better understanding of what are the cost drivers, what are the items that they can try to manage and understand better. And depending on the level of arrangement that you have with MVP, um, there's additional information that's provided. So certain, certain provider groups are provided with information about um, providers that maybe miss having higher utilization than anticipated relative to their peers, or providers that are uh, sharing information that is, or that are admitting, um, referring outside of a smaller network that would help manage costs down. Thank you. Matt, I want to go back to Exhibit 5 on the list of 44 and talk about the second category, which is managing administrative costs and contracts. Would you tell the board about what MVP is doing with contracts, please. Um, for third-party vendors that we that we negotiate or have vendor agreements with, we have policies and procedures in place that to ensure that we're, we're getting a, a, the best price possible. So you can't just hire any third-party vendor. You have to have an RFP or request for proposal from at least two, uh, two different vendors so we can understand what is the product that they're selling and also what are the costs associated with this product. And then that helps inform our decision making to understand the balance of quality product versus cost. Um, it also helps because when you have two or more parties against one another, you can try to leverage them to drive costs down. In the, the uh, more contracting with facilities and providers and PBMs, um, we're going back and forth and having numerous conversations with them. In New York, there isn't a process in place like the Green Mountain Care Board oversight, so it's on the onus of the carriers to go out to uh, providers and facilities and negotiate the best possible contracts possible. Our goal is to deliver an affordable premium rate, so in, in this filing, 89% of every premium dollar is going towards either medical or pharmacy expenses, so we recognize how important it is that we try to manage costs down. So we, we do go through comprehensive back and forth process with our providers and facilities to try to keep costs down to deliver the lowest premium rate possible. And on the PBM side, that's a vendor that, you know, they are actually a third party vendor. Every couple of years, we bring in numerous PBMs and try to understand what are the, what is the best which, which PBM can provide us with the best discounts off average wholesale prices and the, the most rebates. So we're, again, in the effort of trying to keep costs down to make premium rates as affordable as possible, we're going through a negotiation process with our PBMs every couple of years. And then in between those um, RFPs, we're actually going back to the PBM we're contracted with and doing a renegotiation to the extent it's needed. The PBM is also providing a lot of value to us in the, in the sense that they're helping us understand as drugs are coming off a formula or as drugs are coming off a patent and we're adjusting our formularies. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, when a drug is approved by the FDA, there's an exclusivity period. During that time period, it's deemed as a brand drug and they're generally more expensive than generic. So after the patent expires, when, the generic, uh, when a generic drug is released, MVP evaluates its formulary and makes a decision on if we need to make an adjustment to the formulary, formulary to remove the higher cost brand drug from the actual formulary list. Thank you. 
and on administrative costs, uh, how, you, you testified to that to some degree already, but how does MVP undertake initiatives to address administrative costs? Over the last uh, handful of years, it's been an MVP corporate-wide initiative to manage our admin costs down. Um, a number of years ago, we had identified that our, our administrative costs were out of line with our peers. So as in an effort to um, improve on that charge, we've managed the costs down significantly over time. Now, as inflation has taken place and years have gone by, we do have to put some efforts towards updating technology. Health insurance is a very technologically based industry, so we do have to put some um, efforts and money towards improving our technology. But otherwise, it is always our focus on trying to keep our costs down to the point where we're maintaining statutory reserves, meeting our uh, statutory reserve requirements, and offering an affordable premium to the extent possible. Thank you. And would you explain uh, MVP's use of a nationwide network and how that works? Yeah, so MVP only operates in New York and Vermont. But we also recognize that people travel all the time, whether it's for work or vacation, and at those times, you may need to access a provider. Um, additionally, there are, there are points where you may not want to go to a provider in upstate New York or Vermont, and you'd rather go somewhere like the Mayo Clinic or somewhere outside of uh, the Northeast. So MVP contracts with another carrier, that's a nationwide carrier, to ensure that you you can have peace of mind and access to a high quality provider or facility, regardless of where you are in the country. Thank you. And then the last category, Matt, is on managing the plan and membership, which are items 34, 35, 39, 42. Rather than going through each one specifically, could you please describe how MVP is managing the plan and membership to keep costs down? address issues of affordability and other non actual issues. Yeah, so we participate, the, the Vermont Health Connect is an ACA compliant um, small group individual product offering. So we are taking advantage of the benefits included with that, which includes the advanced premium tax uh, subsidy, which comes from the federal government. And in the state of Vermont, there's an additional 1.5% uh, for lower income individuals. So that's helping set a ceiling on how much a given member can pay out of pocket for premium if they meet certain federal poverty restrictions. We're also offering um, non-standard plans to members so that we can offer a different benefit design that we think is going to attract them. So not everybody wants to purchase the standard benefit design. It may not, it may not be a, a cost-sharing structure that is in their best interest. So we offer our non-standard plans to try to fill those gaps for consumers. And also, um, we're continuing to participate in the CSR program. We aren't being funded for it um, by the federal government. We are receiving the Vermont funding. Um, but on top of that, we also have the uh, silver reflective plans as a result of the CSRD funding so that consumers that aren't eligible for APTCs or CSR can purchase a, a silver <coughs> plan that isn't loaded up for the CSRD funding. And what about uh, drug classes being considered preventive? Yeah, additionally, we are, we are um, we're undertaking an initiative this year. There's been a lot of studies that have been performed that, are, that have shown that mental health, there's a lot of overlap with mental health substance abuse disorders with overall um, health of a member or of a person, I should say. And we're undertaking efforts uh, to try to, to try to insource a lot more mental health and substance abuse work and ensure that we can manage the cost of those members more effectively. Matt, if you go, just to wrap up this section, if you go to page two of the exhibit, of exhibit five. Based on all the testimony that you provided on various other factors and testimony earlier today, can you explain uh, how all of that can be summed up 
responding to issues one and two? It's important that MVP not only puts forth the most affordable premium rate relative to the benefits being offered, but also high quality products. So we have a lot of different programs in place that we just discussed to try to ensure that not only is a member receiving an affordable product, but also a high quality product that gives them access to providers, facilities, and pharmacies around the country. Matt, in your opinion, is there a long-term risk in making health insurance affordable for just one year and undercutting price for one year? It depends on the magnitude. In, in one year in isolation, if it isn't, uh, the magnitude isn't huge, then it wouldn't impact a, a well-operating well insurer solvency. But if it continues to happen year over year over year, um, MVP's current reserve position, MVP is down south of New York. We don't operate under RBC. I know Vermont is an RBC state. But New York's guidelines are more percentage of premium based. The minimum percentage of premium of reserves available for an insurer is 12.5%. Our comfort level is closer to 16 to 20%. Um, and right now we're somewhere in the 14 and a half to 15 percent premium range. As I was mentioning just a moment ago, one given year, if the magnitude of the cut isn't too severe, won't take us from 14 and a half percent below our 12 and a half percent threshold. But over time, there is risk that if you can take rate cuts continue, that our reserve position is going to get worse and worse closer to that 12 and a half percent. Thank you. Matt, I just want to go through the statutory criteria. Uh, as I understand it, we have an amended rate, uh, the 10.5 increase suggested by l &E with the statutory criteria, and we are suggesting an additional 0.5% increase for the hospital budget proposals. That gets you 11%, correct? Correct. Based on the rate filing, other evidence in your testimony today that the MVP rates meet the standard of affordability? Yes. Based on rate filing, other evidence submitted today in your testimony today, do the rates promote quality of care and access to health care? Yes. Based on the rate filing, uh, your testimony, other evidence uh, submitted today, are the rates unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law? They are not. Is that because the rates are reasonable based on the data that we have? Yes. And are the rates actually sound and fairly charged premium for services covered in your opinion? With the adjustments, yes. Are the rates uh, excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? No. Are the rates reasonable relative to the benefits that are offered? Yes. Would you agree that rates may be considered adequate if they provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, and regulatory fees, and have reasonable contingency or profit margins? Yes. So the rates here are adequate? Yes. 11%? Yes. Would you agree that rates may be considered excessive if they exceed the rate needed to provide for payments of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, reasonable contingency and profit margins? Yes. So is the 11% excessive? Opinion? No, it's not. Would you agree that uh, rates may be considered unfairly discriminatory if the rates result in premium differences among insurers within similar risk categories that, one, are not permissible under applicable law, or two, in the absence of applicable law, do not reasonably correspond to differences in expected costs? you agree with that standard? Yes. So is the 11% proposed by MVP unfairly discriminatory? It is not. Would you agree with me that the statutory criteria we just went through are all interrelated? Yes. They're not separately siloed? There is interdependence of them. I agree. Any adjustment to a rate increase for whatever reason plus or minus, it all feeds into that final number, correct? That's correct. And it's important that that final number is actuarially sound and reasonable, correct? In this case, the 11%? Correct. In contrast, excuse me, 
And if the board cuts the final number based on a non-actuarial ground, could that adequacy of the rate be in jeopardy? Yes. And in contrast, based on your testimony and the other evidence, uh, it's in evidence uh, the, that the insurance product is affordable with the 11% increase. Uh, in your opinion, does that strike the right balance under all the statutory criteria? It does. And is that the best rate in your view for 2020? Yes. Thank you very much. Any questions? I, I am. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for this witness? Yes, I do. Morning, Mr. Lombardo. Good morning, Mr. Angoff. How are you? I'd just like to make sure that I understand and make sure that the board understands certain concepts. Would you mind turning to page, to uh, exhibit two, page 23, page three of the amended rate file? Yes, page three of the of exhibit of the amended rate filing. Uh, exhibit two. You there? The title at the top is experience period claims. Correct. Correct. Okay, and in the last paragraph there, you talk about IBNR. Do you see that? Yes. Could you explain to the board what IBNR is? Uh, IBNR is an estimate of your outstanding liability. So if you go to the doctor today. The claim may not be paid for three months or so. And um, based on statutory guidance, and so you can evaluate an insurer's reserve or claim adequacy and their income statements, you have to hold appropriate reserve levels. Those reserve levels are audited by a third party uh, every year to ensure that they're within a range of results. So is it fair to say then when when you include IBNR? That is your best estimate of how much you're ultimately going to pay out. Yes. Okay. You, you're not including any any fudge factor or any uh, any variance. That's your best estimate. That's our best estimate. Very good. Could you turn to page seven or page twenty-seven? Of exhibit two. Okay. Okay. And there, okay, there you discuss the. Uh, what you originally were going to do with age, age with respect to age pays, uh, I'm sorry, there you discuss what you were originally going to do based on what was AHP, what was the law relating to AHPs when you filed the, uh, your rate filing. I just want to make, make sure that I understand what the ultimate outcome is. Originally, is it fair to say you were going to raise rates by 1% because AHPs were going to be allowed in Vermont in 2020? That's a true statement. Okay. And based on the, uh, the DFR guidance and the uh, federal court case striking down the, uh, the federal rule on AHPs, it's now the case, isn't it, that in Vermont, AHPs will not be allowed to be sold in 2020? That is my understanding. And, and therefore, you no longer include that 1% that you originally included based on what was then your, uh, what was then the law with respect to AHPs? That's correct. Okay, and let me just make sure you understand the arithmetic. You were going to raise rates by 1%, and I thought I saw a number in here, or maybe it was an LNE's report saying that because AHPs are not going to be allowed in 2020, the, the rate comes down by eight-tenths of a percent, not one percent. Could you explain the arithmetic there? Yeah, th this is a claim adjustment. Um, the 0.8 percent is also considering the impact of uh, our administrative loads and taxes and fees and CTR. Okay, so administrative load and CTR aside, if you're going to put those aside for a second, if you're, going to, if you're going to make a change that raises rates by 1% and you decide not to make that change, does that mean that that 1% proposed increase is no longer uh, applicable? So it's a 1% claim adjustment, so you do have to account for the target loss ratio of 80, approximately 89%, which is where you arrive at the 0.8%, plus it's the reciprocal, so it's 1 divided by that number. 
So the 0.8% is the result of those two different items. I'm sorry, is the, is the result of what two different items? Adjusting for administrative expenses and uh, taxes and fees and CTR, as well as the fact that it's just an arithmetic thing. You have to flip the numbers around. So 110 divided by 100 is plus 10%, but 100 divided by 110 isn't exactly minus 10%. I get it. Um, did you say earlier that MVP uh, in the past year did not get into the AHP business at all? That's correct. And why was that? Um, at, at the time, the, the ruling was passed after we had the ability to adjust and even contact AHPs and, and form our, and submit a filing for 2019. Beyond that, I, I really was not involved in those conversations, so I can't really provide any more input. Okay. And uh, did you make any assumption as to what would happen to the people currently in AHPs in 2020? In, in uh, yes. putting together your rate filing? Um, could you? Could you clarify exactly? Yeah, so, so there'll be no new people in AHPs in 2020, correct? Well, my understanding is that there will not be new people <coughs> in AHPs in 2020. There also will not be the existing people that are enrolled in AHPs in 2019. They'll have to either, they'll have to find insurance coverage through the Vermont Health Connect or another way. Okay, and what did you assume about those people in AHPs in 2020, in, in 2019, who would have to find new coverage? We assume that the members that left the Vermont Health Connect market and went to AHPs were materially healthier, healthier than the members that stayed in AHPs. We assumed that we would see a similar transition in 2020, so there was a second year adjustment as well. So, so you assume that at least some of those people would come back to MVP, correct? Um, what's on page 27 of this document is assuming that there's going to be more members leaving the Vermont Health Connect market because the rates that are offered by AHPs by our competitor are, uh, are more aligned with MVP's exchange rates. So we were anticipating a similar migration in 2020 away from MVP, nobody coming back to MVP. You're assuming that no one currently in an AHP would come back to MVP? In the submitted rates, in the amended filing that we're reviewing? Uh, I'm sorry, no. Now, based on, based on the law today, what, what, if anything, are you assuming as to the extent to which people now in AHPs would come back to MVP? Well, we're hoping to attract um, more than the approximately 1,000 members that we, that we expect that we lost. Um, all that said, the way that premium rates are set, it's based on market-wide average risk. So if they come back into the market, once we take our claims from 2018 and adjust for risk adjustment, it, our rates would not change based on if they came to us or if they went back to Blue Cross. Okay, so those people are healthier than the average in the market, right? They're healthier than the members that MVP was insured. Okay, but you're not assuming that, you're, you're not uh, assuming any red decrease for the people, for those people who are healthier who would come back to MVP. Again, it's because we're pricing to market-wide average risk, so their lower claim costs would be offset by a payment into risk adjustment, which is captured in our 2018 data because HP did not exist. Once you account for the fact that we're paying into risk adjustment, then that gets us to the market-wide average risk prior to HP's existing. So you're not, you're not assuming any separate uh, rate reduction because of the people who would come back to MVP? who are now in the AHP market. I'm not. I'm sorry? We are not. Could you turn page, please, to page six? No, I'm sorry, page 26. The little number six. Okay. 
Uh, in the middle of the page, you see there in the paragraph beginning line 18, adjustment for individual mandate penalty set to zero? Yes. Okay. Am I correct in understanding the following? That last year, MVP assumed that because the individual mandate penalty was zero, that what was approximately 2% of uh, an approximate 2% increase because MVP assumed that the healthiest people would leave because of the zero penalty in the individual mandate, correct? I don't recall the exact adjustment, but we did have an upward adjustment for what you described. Okay. And, and MVP wasn't alone in assuming that, right? That's correct. In fact, you relied on a study by L&E, which said essentially the same thing, right? Yeah, we did our own study, and they were comparable, and we adopted l &E's analysis. Okay, but, but in fact, you found that uh, there was no effect of the uh, zero penalty for the individual mandate, correct? In the Vermont Health Connect market, we did not see a change in 2019 individual marketplace enrollment. So you just, so you took out the so explain what you did then in, in this filing with respect to the, uh, the individual mandate. Uh, we're not making an adjustment because we're seeing that the 2019, 2019 enrollment is comparable to 2018 enrollment. So an adjustment isn't warranted. Okay. And so how much does that reduce the rate by? Um, I would have to go back to the 2019 filing. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Oh, okay, but it's, it's the same amount as was in the 2019 filing. Yes. You're, you're not assuming that. Uh, strike that. That's fine. Um, could you turn to page four, please? Twenty-four. Four. Page twenty-four of Exhibit Two. Page four of the rate file. And you see on the bottom of that page, there's discussion about a pooling charge. Yes. Okay. Could you explain to the board what the pooling charge is? Yeah. Um, claims, high cost claims are very volatile. So in general, your claim curve will kind of look similar from year to year, not to get too much into the actuarial mechanics of it. But if you were to really zoom in on just that last 5% or so of claimants, the really high cost claimants, there's a lot of annual volatility from year to year. So we, we uh, chose $100,000, $100,000, and we analyzed three years of data to understand the historical average of that, of that claim volatility, the, the average claims are in excess of $100,000. We remove claims over $100,000 from the experience period, and then we replace that with the historical three-year average. And so is that the methodology that you followed in past years, too, that you've always used the historical three-year average? Yes. Okay. Um, did you consider, and when you say high-cost claims, in this case, what you're, you mean by high-cost claims is claims exceeding $100,000, right? That's correct. Okay. And you see the table on the top of page 25? Yes. Okay. And you see there the percentage of high-cost claims has... Uh, decreased over the last three years, right? Um, yes, 28, yes, that is the trend that we've seen in recent years. Okay. Did you consider the possibility that maybe uh, the trend is downward and therefore instead of taking a three-year average, you should wait the most recent year, uh, either wait the most recent year the most heavily or even assume that the downward trend is going to continue? Did you consider that? We had conversations about that, but it truly is incredibly volatile from one year to the next. Um, additionally, these high cost claimants, we, as we've grown our enrollment, Ellen even commented in their opinion <coughs> that we are ensuring lower cost, uh, lower benefit members. So you would see a potentially a, a decrease in here, which you're paying back in. But again, there's so much back into your risk adjustment, but you are, there is so much volatility if you look at the tail of any carrier's claims from year to year. 
Um, for example, you know, there is the national reinsurance pool of $1 million that we were talking about. Reinsurance pool? The national reinsurance pool uh, that we discussed earlier. And while well, MVP didn't have any claims exceeding that threshold in Vermont, we did experience some in our New York markets. Um, but then in prior years before that, we didn't experience any of those claimants in our New York markets. You're so, talking now, though, about uh, claims exceeding $1 million, right? Yes. OK, so when, when you say there's a lot of volatility, you were referring initially, weren't you, to the claims above 100000 Yes. OK. And the chart on the page of top five, on the, the top of page five shows high cost claims decreasing from 16.8 to 10.5 percent over three years. Um, it, do you view that decrease as th that that uh, the difference between the 16.8 and 10.5 as highly volatile? There is significant volatility in claims over $100,000. And, and so is that 16.5 to 16.8 to 10.5, is that the basis for your conclusion that there's significant volatility? That's the basis of our 12.5% adjustment. Is it, is it the basis for your conclusion that it's that there's significant volatility? No, there's. I mean, that's just based on a lot of other uh, actuarial studies and, and data that we've analyzed that there is significant volatility. Do you happen to read? Do you happen to recall what the highest percentage of high cost claims was in the years that you've been uh, reviewing these claims in Vermont? I do not. Would it be more than twenty percent? I, I do not recall what the overall range was. Um, this is what I have in front of me, and this is what I can speak to right now. Would you be surprised if it were over 20 percent? I wouldn't be surprised if it were over 20 percent. I also wouldn't be surprised if it were less than 10.5. Can you turn, please, to page, uh, page 8? I'm sorry, page 28. Oh, okay. 28? Page 8 of the exhibit, page 28 of the exhibit. Oh, okay. Okay, and we were just discussing this. This is in the uh, line 21, you see that adjustment for national high cost reinsurance pool? Yes. And you said that the, uh, the, the 0.24 the, by which you're raising rates should not be reduced because you don't anticipate a you haven't had and you don't anticipate any claims above one million in Vermont, correct? It's not a projection of what we anticipate. It's what happened in the 2018 experience period that we're using to set our rates. If there were a claimant in 2018 that were in excess of one million dollars, we would be capturing the impact of the recovery from the CMS national reinsurance pool in the rate development and then also building in the charge that we would have to that we have to pay into the program. Um, you do say, don't you, in that in the last paragraph under line 21, that you do not anticipate any claimants for the rating period. That is, yes, that is the statement that you made. Do you know whether page two of that uh, that exhibit you were going through with Mr. Carnegie? Uh, some of the uh, some of the 44 uh, things that MVP is doing, many of which are clearly laudable to reduce costs. Correct. 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 Okay. Of all those 40, can you point 
to any of those 44, which include or refer to any, any data demonstrating that Vermonters can afford what MVP is selling. What we're presenting is data to show, to support, that we're putting forth a rate that's affordable relative to the benefits being offered, and we're doing our best to manage costs down while also providing access, quality, and quality care. No, no question that these 44 things are, as I said, laudable. You're trying to reduce costs. You're trying to improve quality. But can you point me to any data demonstrating that Vermonters can afford what MVP is selling? We do not address affordability of these benefits relative to what a Vermonter can afford. We are also limited in a lot of regards by the federal government uh, APTC and CSR regulation. So for certain policyholders, they are just bound to whatever the APTC amounts are. Um, but, but outside of that, we aren't addressing anything in terms of if a Vermonter can de deem this as an affordable product. Your senior leader actuarial services, correct? That is my title. And so are you senior leader actu actuarial services for only Vermont or for the whole company? The whole company. Okay. Then you're familiar with uh, MVP's New York rate filing, correct? Correct. Okay. How much of an increase did MVP ask for in New York this year? I would have to refer back to it. Um, in the, so I'd have to refer back to it and it would be speculation. But one given rate increase in a market, in Vermont versus New York, everything is relative to one another. So to the extent that there's adjustments that are applicable in Vermont or um, or just the, the trends that we're offered that are being proposed are different, that's going to impact the rate increases that we're putting forth. I have no further questions. Thank the board to give an opportunity to ask questions. Um, the board, do you want to start down at the end of the table, Robin? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? screening and then if you don't meet the 200 point requirement that's associated with those items you can take uh, there's there's videos or there's um, consultation that you can receive to help understand ways to manage your weight or diabetes or smoking cessation items like that and then the last $200 is attached to um, members or subscribers that wear that have a wearable device if you average certain number of steps per quarter on uh, per day on average, then you can receive $50 per quarter for meeting that criteria. And uh, so what was the enhancement? Is that a new wellness benefit? How does it change from last year? Last year we were only covering uh, gym reimbursement and the activities and it was at a lower threshold. Um, this year it's, and I, I believe the adjustment was, or the reimbursement was $50 and this year um, it's six hundred dollars in total. I would have to okay. double check though the fifty if that's the correct number, but that's what I recall. Okay, thank you. Page three, using the system. 
keeping in mind that part of the answer to number three is confidential, could you talk a little bit about what quality measures uh, you're looking at in your primary care improvement program? Um, that's something that I don't know the exact specifics of what we're providing. We can go back. I can go back and follow up with the team that, that program. Um, that would be helpful. Yeah, you could give, give us information on the quality measures. That would be helpful. Do you happen to know if those quality measures are aligned with uh, the set of Vermont quality measures that are looked at either in the Vermont All Care Model or the Vermont ACO program? <coughs> I don't specifically, I don't want to speculate, so I would, you know, if we could, Great. I'll just start to take notes. That sounds perfect. Um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your New York experience. So you talked about how New York has a DISRIP Medicaid program that has three different levels of payment methodologies. Which payment methodology are you participating with in New York? Currently, um, we, we don't have any level three full capitation arrangements. We do have a number of level one and level two arrangements. Um, generally speaking, when we, the first year of a contract with a provider group, they generally are only willing to take the level one agreement and then we sign a multi-year contract and as, as the contract progresses, it may step up from level one to level two. And is the primary purpose of that to allow the provider group time to adjust to the new methodology, payment methodology? Um, the, the level one initial the outset here, is that what yes. you're speaking yep. Yeah, I think it's to get used to the methodology. Um, it's also, it's also, it's challenging for them to just step into an agreement when they don't understand, when they haven't necessarily been managing care in that same way. So, um, it's they're unwill. There's there's been more challenges getting a provider group to sign contracts in the initial years that where they're taking risk until they have more data at their fingertips. Again, you know, one of the pros of the value-based arrangements is that more data is being shared between carriers and providers. So as they um, accumulate more data, then they can you know, start to be able to manage costs more effectively. And that's when they generally step up and from level one to level two in the contracts. Great. Have you changed your care management programs in any way to adjust uh, for that new value-based program? That's yeah. That that's another one where I'd have to follow up with the team on it. Um, I can make notes. That would be great. Um, and you talked a little bit about in the same exhibit, uh, the care management that you do, uh, including a telemedicine program. And my recollection of your testimony was that, um, just one second. Actually, if we turn to page five, it's, that's four to five is where you describe the telemedicine program. Uh, so when a Vermonter is using that telemedicine program, they're not reaching their Vermont provider, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And how does the information from the telemedicine visit get back to the Vermont primary care provider? Uh, my understanding is that it would be based on the level of consent that's available. Um, electronic records can be shared if the member consents. Now to the extent that the telemedicine benefit information is transmitted back to the, the PCP in Vermont. I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, okay, so it's not like the benefit comes with something like the patient ping technology, for example, that would alert the primary care provider that their patient had received a telemedicine visit from another provider. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. On page six of this same exhibit, um, number 38, you describe uh, your utilization management program as designed to decrease unwarranted variations in care and support appropriate utilization. Uh, do you have any information about trends or uh, specific areas of unwarranted variation that you would uh, 
could speak to in terms of the Vermont population. I, I would have to refer that one back to the medical team as well. <coughs> Um, on page seven of that exhibit, you describe uh, litigation that you're involved with. Do you have any information since the time of filing to update on this question? I'm sorry, what was that? On page seven, you describe litigation that your company is involved in. And it includes the fact that there might be an entry of final judgment in June or July 2019. I'm wondering if you've received that judgment. I have not, no, no one has transmitted or provided any information to me. I did reach out to our legal team last week and I haven't heard back from them on that. Okay. If you have, could you please let us know? Yep. Um, the other question I had was about the new ambulatory surgical center that's opened in Vermont. At the time of filing of the materials, uh, you had not finalized uh, information with that company. I'm wondering if you could give us an update about that. We did contact our uh, contracting team to understand. This was a few weeks ago, um, so it's not as of today. Yeah. If any contract has been finalized, and the feedback that we received was it has not yet been finalized. Could you check on that and update that? Yes. Address? Well, thank you. Um, so I, my first question uh, just has to uh, offer some context here for this discussion. And um, I refer to Exhibit 11, which was the uh, uh, table that showed the impact on the various plans uh, with the fix that the DFNR requested uh, for the whole plan. And um, I'm looking at the, <coughs> the numbers in terms of the projected 2020 uh, premium versus the current 2019 premium, and that's 204.3 million versus 180.6 million or 0.7 million, which is a, a, a change of about 15.6 million uh, which, in terms of. Yeah, I'm sorry. Which page are you using? Pardon me. Which page are we? Um, and one other um, 
context here is that you're looking at an MLR um, in this filing at 90.6, um, which is a, an important number to me because it, it, it connects the two biggest moving parts, which are premiums and claims. So do you, do you sense that that, um, you know, looking at uh, past uh, filings um, going back into 2016, that number has been very volatile um, and I'm uh, wondering if you feel that it is kind of settling into a range that you have really sat solid confidence about. The MLR, so there's items that are outside of our control in some of the MLR items. For example, the ACA insurer tax. The federal government has had a moratorium um, one or two years, and then they've reinstated it. So that that's a 1% charge that is out of our control that is going to directly impact the loss ratio from year to year. So in the 2019 rates, um, we did not have an ACA charge of 1% built in, but this year we have to build that ACA mm -hmm. charge back in. So that's going to cause a swing. Um, additionally, we, have, we do have a, a fixed PMPM administrative load, so depending on how the claim projection is changing relative to our administrative changes from year to year, that's going to have an impact on our loss ratio. Um, so. I would say that the MLR, the target MLR, there's some items that are outside of our control. So I, I wouldn't feel confident that what we have today is going to be predictive of what exists in the future. Um, I wouldn't expect significant changes for the items that MVP can control unless there's a dramatic change in claim trend um, in, 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 in future years. Well, that's helpful, and so um, I'm wondering if you can do this. Um, I'm looking back at the um, uh, the MLRs that uh, were the filings in 2016, 17, and 18, and um, they were 91.3, 91.6, and 89.7, according to your supplemental filings with the uh, National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Um, but the actual MLRs on those same documents are at 99.5%, 77.1%, and 91.9% respectively. So there's there's a lot of noise there, and uh, I don't, you know, it would be helpful if you could go back and look at those and then kind of connect the dots in terms of, of, of what the major moving parts are between uh, what you predicted in your filing or the target in your filing and, and, and how things actually uh, unfolded. Yeah, I can actually speak to one or two of those items. Um, I know in 18, one, one of the items that's driving the, so first I'll caveat that the NAIC filing is separate. The way that it's measured, there's a lot of prior year noise that can be built into it. So for example, we don't receive our final risk adjustment results. For, we didn't receive our 2018 risk adjustment results until um, June 28th or somewhere around there of 2019. But we have to close our books at the end of December of 2018. We make an assumption at that point about what we anticipate our risk adjustment payment to be um, or receive, depending on the market. So if you look at an AIC filing, it, 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 you know, I will just say that there is a lot of that noise from year to year that could be influencing our loss ratios. Additionally, um, what's, what's reflected in the fourth quarter of 2017 and 2018 is the CSR defunding. So there's going to be some variances from expectation because those were um, liabilities that we didn't collect premium for. Mm -hmm. That would, it would just be helpful to have that. Um, okay. if it's, it's not clear in the NAC documents of, 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 of what that uh, variance and volatility are. Okay. Um, my next question is, um, again, looking at page six on uh, exhibit 11, it profiles the uh, 2019 premiums by plan. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm looking at, for example, uh, those numbers relative to federal poverty levels. Um, and um, so the, to me, there is a, a really stark uh, uh, contrast between uh, those plans below 400% of poverty and uh, or customers below 400% of poverty and those above 400% of poverty. And it's a wall, it's not a gradual uh, cliff at all. And 
by um, <clears throat> over the year, uh, we worked with Diva a bit to just kind of figure out what that wall looked like. And if I can tell you what we found, um, if we, um, yeah. we could talk about it a yes. bit. That, um, so if you're looking at something just like a 399% of poverty for a bronze plan, for a single, and this is for a, a bronze plan, uh, the single premium was $426, which you'll find on that exhibit. Um, 800, uh, uh, <clears throat> but but but, but the, the the premium, excuse me, let me step back. The the established premium was $426 a month. Someone below 400% of poverty, just below 400% of poverty, was paying $203 or 5.1% of their income. On the other side, that 400% someone that's uh, at 401%, they were paying uh, the full premium because there's no subsidies at all. Um, and that's 9.36% of their income. Similarly, for a couple, um, if you're just below the 400% line, you're paying $150 a month. That's 2.73%. Just for the premium, you've got co-pays and deductibles to out, outstanding. Uh, but someone right across that line is at $852. <coughs> Or 13.8 percent. That pattern continues um, up through adults and and family, and it's just it's, it's hard for me to see, you know, a couple in Vermont that's that pay sixty-five thousand dollars, two people in the forties and fifties working, uh, concerned about health care issues, they're not young enough to say I, nothing's going to ever happen to me, and to be in a position of having to pay 13.8 percent, 13.8 percent of their income just for uh, the premium, and I'm wondering if you have any, um, <clears throat> if you if you uh, look at my concurring vote last year uh, on your proposal, um, I came out of the box with a with an opinion of, of talking about my real concern about affordability, and I'm just uh, um, and I, I think I laid out a, a plan, could be debated or not, a plan to address this. Um, I I personally don't think. It would cost that much to close that gap between 400 and 450 percent of poverty, or 450 to 500, because if you take the federal standard at about 9.8 percent of income as affordable, quote unquote, that wedge closes pretty rapidly. Um, so I'm wondering what thoughts you might have um, about how we can. Address that that cliff. Yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's all very true and you know very um, real. Um, my general thought is the the safeguards that are in place under the federal ACA and also the additional subsidies from Vermont. If, other than, I mean, as a carrier, we're, we are trying our best to put forth the lowest premium possible relative to the benefits of recovery, you know, as, which is met with the growth in our market share. Um, but to address what you're <laughs> referencing, it almost feels like a change in legislation would be needed. That's something that I don't, public policy, I don't really want to step way into those waters. But if outside of some sort of public policy change or legislative change, that would be the way that I would think about that initially. Well, and, and I know um, uh, spending having spent years at the State House that you do have representation in the State House. Um, and I agree with you that it is a legislative issue, but it, it, it rolls back to these premiums and 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 the percentage of people's incomes that they're kind of you kind of pay <coughs> in terms at all. My next question is um, just in terms of, of moving from the uh, um, proposed from, from, from the uh, rearview mirror of the hospital budgets to the proposed budgets um, um, as a standard. What level of detail have you gotten? I mean, we haven't even seen those budgets yet, haven't had hearings on the 2020 budget, uh, but yet their they're, they're proposals are being used in this process. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of level of actuarial work that you've done. Uh, on those um, 2020 budgets in terms of uh, Medicaid share, Medicare share, commercial share, 
bad debt, free care, all those moving parts that go into that budget process have not been scrubbed yet. Yeah, uh, we're, we're using whatever the net patient revenue changes that the care that the hospitals are proposing for all categories of, of that uh, will be applicable yeah. here. So commercial, right. um, and that that's the best estimate of how our actual rate filing and our claim and costs. Have, will be. have you gone back and looked at the history of between what hospitals submit and what the board has approved? As a, as a guide? Uh, well, I know Melanie last year used that information to uh, inform their recommendation for the adjustment between the what was in our rates versus proposed hospital budgets versus what they ultimately expected to be approved. Now, our approach uh, is that we should use the best data available because what has happened in past years may not be indicative of what is going to happen this year. So. The best data we have available to us right now is the proposed hospital. Now, I, I understand it's a data point, but what's interesting most of this um, rate review process, it is a rear view mirror look, whether it's pharmacy or medical trends or administrative trends, you know, it's looking in the rear view mirror and trying to statistically predict forward, walk forward, and here we're taking a data point that's out in the future is inconsistent, I think, the current number with the all-pair model target of 3.5%. Um, and uh, you know, the board hasn't even had time to visit that yet. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it kind of doesn't fit the scenario of most of the other data that's being used in, in setting these rates. Um, my next question is uh, uh, having to do with uh, the cost shift um, in terms of uh, your, your actuarial work. Um, I went through and looked uh, in your filings for a number for the cost shift uh, because it's certainly something that uh, that um, the commercial carriers uh, have to deal with, um, um, even though it's kind of a hidden a, a hidden pressure. Um, the board, uh, by statute in Vermont, has to measure annually what the cost shift is, and uh, in for. Um, 2019, the estimate is that it's uh, uh, it's in the it's in the range of 216 million dollars. So it is a big number. Um, and I look at the appropriations uh, in the state budget for 2020, and uh, for the key appropriation that affects Medicaid expenditures, uh, which is the uh, Medicaid uh, global commitment uh, line item. Uh, for 2018, the uh, total appropriation was $719 million. For 2019, it was $731 million, or just a 1.7 percent increase. And for 2020, it was $738 million, or just a nine tenths of one percent increase. Um, and that included a $1.1 million increase for an expanded dental benefit. So. These are the numbers that we're looking at relative to a Medicaid program that serves about 22% of Vermont Vermonters. And here we are with you folks uh, looking at you know, plus or minus 10% for a much smaller share. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the cost shift um, and, and whether it's just, from your perspective, just embedded in the trend uh, data and it is what it is or it's something that needs to be addressed. It is, it is implicitly included in the trend that we have included in the filing, the proposed trend. Um, now, whether or not that is a problematic, that's a, you know, that's a debate that's outside of the actuarial scope. Um, I, I agree with you that the fact that Medicaid is not going up at the same rate as what other providers or facilities need to run their business, that is definitely resulting in higher cost trends in the commercial market. Um, but our job is to set forth a rate that is adequate for what's being covered. And unfortunately, that cost shift is included in those trend figures. Well, maybe we can change that over time a bit. Um, my next question has to do with, I can be on the right here. Um, 
is the employer share in the, in the small market. Um, there was a study uh, in 2015 that uh, indicated that uh, in the um, small in, in employer uh, market, that between 66% and 75% of the premium was supported uh, by the employer. Um, and, I'm, and that's a 2015 number, and I'm just wondering if you have any sense as to where that might be now. No, that's, that's something that's outside of my scope of knowledge. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you just turn to Exhibit 7, page 2? There's a chart on there. This is the final 418, correct, in the 18 column. I believe that's the case. Um, so yeah, we would have 18 over 17 at this point because we have enough run out. Um, what I, I guess I'll go back to what I was addressing earlier with differences in allowed versus or proposed and actuals. Um, it, it's really driven because of our membership changes, it can be driven substantially by how much our membership has been changing. Um, so this deviation, would it, would it be fair to say that over time, the difference between the voting and actual as your market stabilizes would be closer? I would assume, especially as our population has gotten larger, because a smaller data set, you know, we had 10,000 members in 2017. While that sounds like a big number, it can take a few costs or a few high cost claims can really drive that actual trend figure to be much higher than we would expect. Um, so it, it's there's a lot more volatility as you accumulate more data and you have a more stable population, then um, you shouldn't see as many changes as long as the benefits being, being covered are, are comparable. That said, we did an interesting review of our claim cost distribution and it was it was really telling to us that um, 50 50 percent of the lowest 50 percent costs or lowest utilizers of members only accounted for somewhere in the four to five percent range of overall cost for a commercial book of business and then the highest five percent cost members accounted for 50 percent so they're kind of flipped around the curve is very rises very steeply, right? So um, to the extent that in that tail, where it's so volatile from one year to the next, just changes by one to two members, or one really high cost member maybe only had, I know we used $100,000 as our pulling point, but suppose that the average cost over 100,000 in one year is only 105,000, and the next year, you have the same number of people over 100,000, but it's an average cost of 125,000, that can have a really substantial impact on your overall claim trend. Um, so yeah, those changes, there's there's a lot that can go into an actual trend figure um, that you really have to kind of peel back the onion. Okay. Thank you. So you'll follow up with the 2018 and 2019. Um, so and actually, my second question then, and we've talked about this market share that MDP has gained in the last few years. 10% of the market, the QHP market in 2016 to 40% now. Um, and clearly when you submitted the rate filing, you did not know the competitors you know, rate filing at that point in time. Yep. So I'm wondering what are you assuming now, given that you have a better idea of the landscape for 2020, what is the expected growth in market share that you 
might anticipate? It, you know, it really depends on what the ultimate rate increase is. As they currently stand, as, based on LME's recommendations, we, we expect our relative position to be comparable to where we were in 2019. I think it's going to be a little bit different. So if we're around 11, excuse me, um, I don't recall who Cross's exact recommendation, but I think it was somewhere in that 11 range. So largely, we expect our position to be unchanged. Um, but given the, the spread that we're seeing right now, we're optimistic that we can we can continue to grow market share. Um, what is our kind of? Uh, I, I don't know what the maximum level would be. I think that's really contingent on the ultimate approval rate increase and just um, continuing to market to our consumers and, and make people in Vermont make Vermonters more aware of MVP's product. Well, I guess in part my question was driven by if more people migrate to MVP. Would, for example, your estimate of the per member per month administrative cost of $42 be correct? Or if one will migrate and you're spreading those fixed costs over for individuals, would you have to make an adjustment to that estimate? It's a matter of understanding our fixed costs broken out by Vermont versus enterprise wide. Um, that would be the level of detail that we have to understand before we would be comfortable, uh, be comfortable making a definitive statement about that. Okay. Um, I noticed that uh, you adjusted the premiums up slightly for leap year, given that there's going to be an extra year. Does that mean next year we'll have the went down because there'll be one less year in your experience period than in your rating period? Yeah, when we're using 2020 data, we'll definitely back out. Yeah. We'll do 365 or 366. I believe we did that in the, 20, in the 2018 filing where we used 2016 data. So, okay. uh, we'll start with that in the other direction. Yep. <laughs> Um, so I think I was struck uh, by some of the differences in unit cost increases for providers that were regulated by the Green Mountain Care Board and providers that are outside of the regulatory authority of, of the Green Mountain Care Board. In fact, the unit cost increase was twice as much for those outside of what the Green Mountain Care Board regulates. And that second category was quite substantial. I recognize there was an adjustment to at least 40% of the spend <coughs> happening outside of what Regulates. My understanding is that is growing, right? That portion of spend that's happening outside of what the Green Mountain Care Board regulates is growing. Can you just speak a little bit to what's happening outside, why there's growth towards providers, whether that be in New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Florida, where that's happening, why it's growing, and what what we can foresee about expenditure growth, if that's the pattern. Yeah, so I would, in, in, in New York, we are doing our best to try to manage costs down. Um, it's generally when we at the outset of negotiations with a provider or facility, there's usually a pretty big spread. We, we generally come out with a number um, that's probably around zero, or close to zero, and then they come out with a much larger number. And we have to always balance the importance of having an adequate network with access um, for, for, for our members versus cost. So there's a lot of there are a number of um, facilities where if, if, you were, if we were to remove that facility from our uh, network, then the, the product itself would then become unappealing. It would not be a marketable um, figure. So it's kind of a, a negotiation of how much leverage, how much negotiating power do we actually have. Um, that, that's, the, that's the one item. Um, in terms of members traveling um, or going outside of our jurors, or outside of where we manage costs in New York, in Vermont, we do rely on a third party. Um, we do update our contract terms with them, but we are generally receiving whatever their discounts are at given facilities. So we are, we, my understanding is that there isn't some sort of secondary fee schedule that we're paying that's, that's impacting us. But we do feel that being able to provide members with access to whether it's a facility like Dartmouth-Hitchcock, um, who we negotiate with, or Mass General in Boston, who we rely on our third-party vendor, or Sloan Kettering in New York City, those are all, it's important to have that access because not only costs may be more expensive at those facilities, but it's also, those are also centers of excellence where 
Um, there could be downstream impacts of, that are actually reducing costs. You may pay more up front and then have uh, fewer costs down the road. Why are we seeing more migration to those facilities outside of the Green Mountain Care Board jurisdiction? It sounded like there was more migration out there. Do you know what's driving that? Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't speak to that. Okay. It may just be the conditions or the location of, of our members. Okay. Um, thank you. So, another question related to that was, um, when you're selecting your network, how much weight do you place on the price that you can negotiate versus the quality of the provider? And how do you even assess quality of providers and when you're thinking about your network? Yeah, we, we have, um, so we have accreditation uh, that we, that providers are credentialing that providers have to go through to, um, to, to actually be part of the network. So there is at least a minimum floor of quality that you have to meet. Um, we're currently undertaking um, an analysis of cost efficiency, which is balanced with, um, which is balanced with quality. So we, we are trying to identify who are the bad actors, I suppose you could say, on both fronts, um, and, and determine who those that are that have low quality and, and higher than average costs. Um, and then also balance that with high quality and high cost. So the line, I guess, is our credentialing. Um, now, above and beyond that, we're, we're undertaking that project right now. It's, at, it's a really so I've been just introduced to this project. It's really complicated at this point because to understand cost, you have to try to capture all the all the triple. So you're trying to isolate the cost by for the provider, but you have to also isolate the referral patterns, and um, you have to get apples to apples comparisons for like procedures. So you don't want to compare a provider that's doing a lot of routine services against a, a similar provider in the same specialty is doing more high intensity procedures. So you have to really isolate all those different metrics. Um, so we are undertaking that initiative. It's proving to be a very challenging initiative, but it, more to be determined. Well, I, I would say, I would add on to that, I would be very interested in hearing more about that, I think, and what is the potential impact on rates if you can you know, identify providers who are low value, high cost providers not potentially be paying for those services. I would imagine that would help consumers. Um, but like Robin, I think um, I'm interested in your work and the follow-up on the unwarranted variation in um, medical care for the mom population and understanding more about what you're doing uh, to think about that. Um, and I'm also just I'm wondering in particular, if does MVP ever drop providers who, for example, uh, as you described, the bad actors are those providers who um, have you know, high frequency readmissions or surgery do-overs or other kind of metrics by which you can really say this is probably poor quality care, we don't want to pay for it. Does, does MVP drop providers like that? I see you give carrots for high performing performance. Mm -hmm. Do you give sticks for poor performance? Yeah, um, if, if, if those metrics then lead to, those poor quality measures then lead to either not meeting credentialing standards or a certain, if we want to go forth, once we have our analysis completed, if we identify who these providers are, um, the goal would be to remove them from the benefit designs, or at least offer a subset of benefits. I will highlight that we did offer, a couple of years ago, we had a, for about three years we offered um, a limited network product in our New York population, which had a price decrement of approximately 10%. That was somewhere in the 9 to 10% range. And we actually stopped offering it because when we, when we contacted consumers and asked why, they said, well, it was, and it, this was a robust hospital system down in the mid in the Hudson Valley, New York, more down towards New York City. Consumers said, we wanted more access to providers. So we're trying to understand what that right balance is between quality, cost, and basically what is the market. It's, it's something that we are undertaking, I can tell you that. Right. Well, welcome to the triple aim, right? The cost, quality, and access, we're all trying to figure that exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
My last question actually this is also related to that. How many QHP members are do you know are using that online tool? The online tool came on, you know, for cost and you know, quality or mostly cost uh, comparison tool. You know, in the few, first couple of years there was not a lot of traffic to that website. Has the traffic grown at all? At least um, in our population here in Vermont? I would have to contact our, our marketing team for that data. Okay. And I'm wondering if it has had any impact. Have you, you know, also, they might know, has it had any impact on changing the traffic patterns of where people seek care? If they know the actual cost of the care. Yeah, I, yeah, that would be something I would have to contact the marketing department for. Great. Those are my questions. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to piggyback on some of the questions that were previously asked, but if we look at um, the high cost claim, you know, I was also struck by how it was going down year over year, the 16.8, 13.6, 10.5, to get to the 12.5. And I believe you stated, or in the documentation, there, there was an increase to um, premiums that that was causing, I think like 0.6%. That sounds reasonable. I believe uh, the experience period claims were less than the pooling charge, that, so the amount that we removed was less than what was added back in for the three-year average. So it's going up by point six. And, and you know, just to go on, you know, some of the prior questioning. I mean, the trend. It doesn't seem like it's erratic. It, it's been going down a pretty, you know, 16.8, 13.6, 10.5. So to go with the 12.5, I mean, if we had gone on with a, ten, a lower number like the 10.5, then that certainly would have been a lower increase to premiums, correct? Yes, if that number was lower, it would have been a lower increase to premiums, correct? Okay. Um, admin costs, my favorites, right? Um, I, I also looked at it. I think one of the things that has been happening year over year is you do keep increasing, obviously, in Vermont. And, you know, it's based on assumptions that you put in. And I appreciate that you've been declining in New York as well. And, you know, I did look back to see what you have said in the past. And you've said it was about 50-50, 60-40 between fixed and variable costs. And so, you know, because each year you come in and you base the year on on the current year's membership. You know, I went back and looked at, you know, for, for 19, you based it on um, 25,000 and came in at 30,000. And if I just used 50-50 and said 50 variable, 50 fixed, what that would have done to the $40 or roughly $40, it would have brought it down by about $3.30. And if I then carry forward and look at where you currently are for 2020 at 30,887, and if you did get an increase of 3,000, that would be a reduction from 42 down to 40.14. If you if you got 6,000, you know it would reduce by you know almost four dollars. So you know the the tough part is I I get that you're having less of your, but part of Vermont's is a variable piece. And so as we have more membership and you have more, you're collecting those the $42 across all those members and the member increases, you not only contribute more to cover the fixed, you have you don't need as much on the variable piece or you can you know, the variable that's you don't need as more as much on the fixed. So I'm, I'm just trying to say how how do we come to terms with the fact that we keep increasing and we're not really getting those benefits um, because of some of the assumptions you have in for what membership would be. Yeah, so I, I guess I would think, uh, well, the variable is generally the same on a per member per month basis. But I think it's that there's a fix. There's two levels of the fix. There's the enterprise-wide fix versus potentially like an MVP Vermont-specific fix. So. Um, we have an office in Vermont. That will be a fixed expense, obviously, that as we grow more Vermont membership, that should go down over time. But the enterprise-wide fixed expense is something that it, um, I would have to ask the financial team to, to be able to break that out at that level of detail. But I think that's, that's the way I would think about it. To the extent that we are growing 
our membership in Vermont, the Vermont fixed piece, I agree, would go down. Um, but the variable, I'm thinking, in my opinion, would stay flat. And then the fixed enterprise-wide is something, is another one that is dependent on our overall enterprise-wide membership. It's just a challenge because we keep running into, you know, we're going up in membership. I, uh, and I, I completely understand. Question on page 66. When you look at the price and trend assumptions. Uh, tab one, page 66. And when you look at the um, leverage and impact, and we look at you know, the allowances and then how copays and deductibles end up reducing that amount right, to come up to what you get, what you would get paid. When we looked at the deductible piece in 2020, we were looking at $60.21. And last year it was $56.27, so about a $4 difference or per year about $48. And how does that then correspond to if I look at deductible, the change year over year for deductibles and maximum out of pocket? So for for silver, for instance, the deductible is going up by 400. The maximum out of pocket is 200. Bronze, it's 300, 300. Gold, it's 50, 300. And platinum is pretty low. And yet the reduction is only you know, $48. So it just seems you know consumers are paying a lot more out of pocket or for their for their deductibles or maximum out of pocket, right? Mm -hmm. And yet when it translates back, it's only a four dollar offset. So I mean, how do we look at that relationship? Because you know, each year it just creeps up slowly, and that's one of the big things we'll hear from consumers about how much more they're paying. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand um, the question, but let me just try to answer the, the way I interpret it. Um, this. I believe what you're asking is about how our benefits are changing year over year and that their the deductibles may be increasing or decreasing. The adjustment in the deductible column on page 66 that you're referencing, yeah. that is reflective of 2018 services. Um, when we develop our plan level premium rates, those, those actuarial values, the pricing actuarial values that we develop, capture the impact of deductibles and out-of-pocket impact. Um, so this, this, uh, this figure right here is based purely on what happened in the 2018 experience period projected forward. Now that said, we are enrolling members in leaner benefits. So as, that, as, that, as we're enrolling members in leaner benefits, those are generally plans that have higher deductibles. So to look at last year's figure, um, and, and identify what the changes from last year to this year. I think it should also be measured against uh, a change in the average deductible that, that members are, are seeking. I think that's what I was trying to do. Say this change was fifty dollars roughly, right? So basically, you are saying that it's, it's a fifty dollar impact year over year, but the deductibles are going up by three or four hundred dollars, two hundred. So it, it's just it seems like you know more of that shift is shifting to the consumer, yet you're not offsetting all of that here. And I understand it wouldn't be a one-for-one because one everybody doesn't use that, but I just wanted to correlate you know, that $50 versus. Um, well, if, if a benefit is changing, say there was a $1,500 deductible in 2019, and then in 2020 there was a $2,000 deductible, the value of that $500 increase in deductible is being passed on in the rate increases that we have um, in the premiums that we're offering. So if we were to go to, um, I believe it's page 73, the long table of all the premiums, there's a column that says benefit actuarial value. Um, it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns in. That benefit actuarial value is capturing the impact of any benefit changes that are taking place. So there is a premium offset that is implicitly included 
specifically about consumers who didn't pay their premiums and then have claims against those. Is there any way for you to marry those up in some fashion? So, you know, if, if I'm not paying my premium and then I'm getting, you know, I'm able to collect claims and have claims paid, you know, it seems like we would be able to leverage that against that consumer, you know? Um, I'm not an expert on the policy, but there is a grace period that exists where even if a member doesn't pay their premium, we do have to cover their claims. Um, and there is, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any recourse that we can take to the extent that um, a member has exceeded the grace period and isn't paying their premiums, then that's where we will intervene and do a, do a review to ensure that we're not um, driving up costs for Unnecessarily for members that are actually paying their premiums. So, um, I, within the grace period, there isn't any recourse that MVP can take for those members. Um, for fraud and waste, you know, how much do you actually collect on fraud and waste? And do you guys have an estimate of what you think is out there for fraud and waste? I, I haven't ever gotten an exact figure for that. I did have a conversation with our SIU lead uh, last week just discussing some of the programs that they have in place. They are doing, they've, they've improved the staff, they've increased the, the staffing, and they've actually, through that, done a lot more analytics and data mining. Um, so they're trying to identify irregular practice patterns or fraud or waste may exist in the system. To put an actual number on what they estimate as a percentage or total dollar amount, that wasn't something that we discussed. But I do know that we are increasing our efforts um, to try to try to proactively identify what are some of the items that we can address before it actually gets into uh, a litigation case or or having to address it after the fact, so that we can set up our systems to automatically identify some of these irregular patterns and be more proactive. You don't have a percentage of what you guys estimate might be a fraud waste out there. I do not. Um, we talked about the cost savings and you know, gave specific examples of telemedicine and things like that. Um, you know, how much do you think these have benefited year over year of the changes? Um, are, are you speaking to like the, the cost impact? So, <laughs> While utilization is increasing substantially when you look at telemedicine in isolation, it's a very small percent of our overall, uh, our overall utilization. To the extent that there's growth, um, we will capture that in our refilings in the telemedicine benefit, but um, it isn't enough to really move the needle at this point. I, I would just, I, I, I advocate for it. I think it's a really effective tool to utilize. Um, but I think there's a lot of education that goes along with that. What we've identified, we've, we've analyzed segments of our population and who's actually utilizing the telemedicine benefit the most. And what we've identified is that self-insured clients that we have are utilizing telemedicine more than large employers, but they're utilizing it more than the small groups and the individual employers. And, the reason why we think ASO clients or self-insured clients are the ones that are utilizing those benefits is because there's a direct cost that the, that the client is experiencing. So they recognize that there is a savings opportunity that exists, and they're putting a lot more marketing materials forth, a lot more member education or employee education to utilize those benefits. We do try to educate members on that benefit through our um, member welcome packet or on our website. But there isn't a way for us to just 
kind of pick up the phone and call people directly and tell them you should utilize the telemedicine benefit in this instance. Um, outside of potentially where we have those programs in place like the ER, the high utilizer of an ER program. Um, program. Mm -hmm. okay. But do you embed anything within the premium rates right now for cost savings that you'll be getting, you know, whether that is moving people you know, out of the ER into primary care specialists? What we're capturing right now is the experience that we had in 2018. Um, our utilization trends were volatile, uh, so we don't have any utilization trend, and we're not building in anything for additional utilization of something like telemedicine or reduction in ER. Okay. And then looking at you know the LNE recommendations, you know several of them were because there's new information you know, that we have, whether the risk adjustment, things like that. But on the medical utilization, which uh, the proposal is to increase by 1.5%. What would have happened if Melanie didn't find that? We would have continued with uh, operating under the assumption that we didn't have enough data to quantify what we, uh, the utilization trend of anything other than 0%. Now, because utilization trend is scanning the entire market and provider practice patterns, it is, it is helpful for LME to have the entire market scan and actually be able to analyze both competitors' uh, data to provide an estimate because we do think that is a more appropriate approach to quantify utilization trend. And I do have one question about the confidential information, so how do we manage that? Um, so this is a public meeting we have to go into a public session. Okay. Or can I refer to it and not say the numbers? Uh, well, if the question calls for an answer that discloses the numbers, which, which, which document are we talking about? I am talking about uh, tab 3, tab is A, page 5.